Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrano with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. We're going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. Um, whoosh. ladies and gentlemen, it's been a rough week. It's a, it's been a, I've been in trial. I just did closing arguments myself yesterday, so mm-hmm. I'm appropriately mindset it in for the trial recap of Karen Reed today. Welcome to this edition of the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm your host, Omar Serrato, joined by Melissa Pacheco, who will, for, who will forever be known as Nicole Kessinger. You still can't let that White. go? No, no, no. It was my favorite interaction with you ever because I got to make you cry. We have Dominic, who is enjoying a beverage that I'm not going to comment on. Um, it's a whiskey kind of day. Um, it's they're, They've been going for a couple of weeks now on the Karen Reed case. I haven't had an opportunity to watch all those days of trial, um, but uh, I have been able to catch up on the recaps. And so here's what I think so far about what's going on. I commented it before the case that I thought the defense team was rock stars. They are putting on, it's not a perfect case. Uh, there's there's been some criticism over them maybe over sensationalizing some of the evidence. For example, they used yearbook fo- yearbook photos to try to prove that there was perjury in this case. Some Take comments to consider our show sponsor Aura Internet Security. If you have been following my Instagram or my Facebook, you would know that we have been attacked by hackers, and the, both of those accounts have been. Deleted, ripped off of the face of the earth, it happens. Hacking is a real thing that occurs. And let me tell you something else. Uh, Data brokers will sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. And you might not believe it, but your full name, your email address, your home address, your health records, your relatives, your children, your spouse, all of it is out there. I am a lawyer. I do my own background checks. I pay good money for my background checks, but it's starting to get to the point where you could Google anybody's name and some kind of a secondary source of information, such as a birth date or email address or something. And you will find that you can Google all of this information. It's just out there for people to exploit. That's why um, I have decided to use Aura, the sponsor of today's video on Aura shows me, they show me specifically which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. And I'll tell you what, I had them when I signed up for their services, they showed me there was three separate internet brokers that were selling my information that they automatically got rid of for me by taking the initiative to opt out of those uh, memberships. So cleaning up my information, cleaning up your information, and it only reduces the amount of spam that I get, It protects me from hackers that could use my information to help them access my social media accounts. Highlight, if you've been a follower of my Instagram or my TikTok, or well, not my TikTok, but my Facebook, you will know that that account, those accounts no longer exist. They had nothing to do with anything. I had a a 20-year-old Facebook account. It's completely gone because of hackers, spammers, whatever you want to call it. It's gone. So it protects me from that. It protects your social media accounts, your bank accounts, other sensitive information. Also, Aura does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. I get other features like uh, antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set it up. I did it, matter of fact, this morning. Um, It took me about a couple of minutes to get me all set up and protected Um, And you get it all at a really easy, affordable price. Um, But beside that, you might already have some of these tools already, but but not but not having aura is like is literally like leaving, locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. People just walk right in and take all of your stuff. I value my privacy. I value yours. You can go right now to aura.com slash tilted lawyer. Um, to start your two-week free trial, no cost to you. It's going to be linked below to in the description. 
Go in and sign up for your free 14-day trial and experience all of the protection that comes with Aura Internet Security. It's powered by inter- artificial intelligence. You're not going to regret it. Go on, go on in and Peace. check them out. Some commented that the prosecution should have objected, and yeah, they should have. Um, but from right now, here, here's my theory of trial. Everything in trial, you have to put it in stages. There's a middle stage, and for the middle stage, you put in all the middle bits. But what you have in at the bookends of that is he has primacy and recency. You got to start strong. You got to finish strong because that's what people are going to remember. You have your initial impressions and you have your lasting impressions from the closing. And that's what people remember. That's what jurors are going to remember. They seldom remember the middle stuff. And I say that only because the prosecution had to come in and basically wow the jury with something. And from what I've seen, through nine, 10 days of trial now, it's been extremely underwhelming. And Melissa is here for emotional support. She doesn't have any legal expertise. I didn't bring her in for her legal analysis. She's here to provide layperson commentary whenever appropriate, maybe add some levity to uh, the podcast. And then, of course, Dominic is here to make sure that we're all sounding good. Uh, don't ever know who she is, LOL. Oh, don't even know who she is. I'm not who we're, I'm not sure who we're talking about. Pokey? Um, So we're doing this broadcast live. We've never done this before. Yes, we did. Well, we did a couple weeks, just Mm -hmm. you and I, without Dominic. And um, we did the best we can. We could. We did our level best. Um, Now we're going to give uh, Dominic a crack and see if he can make a sound even better or worse. I don't know. It's possible. So, all right, let's jump right into uh, Karen Reed. If, you, if you're unfamiliar with the story, just to give you a brief rundown, Karen Reed was drinking with her boyfriend, Mr. O'Keefe. They went to a bar. They were out with friends. They were bar hopping. Uh, when, me, when myself and Ileana had initially visited this case, there was some speculation that she may have had, according to what was out there, the equivalent of maybe a... 0.25 BAC. If she had eight to nine drinks that night of a clear liquid, a clear substance, maybe it was a mixed drink and the testimonies have kind of borne that out. But she was clearly intoxicated. The theory that the prosecution wants you to believe is that there was an occasion later that night where Karen Reed ran over Mr. O'Keefe with her car, leaving him for dead in the elements where he either died from blunt force trauma, or he died of the elements. Either way, Karen Reed was responsible for the murders, and that's their theory of the case. There was an argument. She was pissed off, and whether or not she did it on purpose, she ran him over and just left, and then there was all this craziness going on. And, you know, 4 or 5 in the morning, Karen Reed is like, where, where is uh, my boyfriend? And uh, the way that her defense is presenting it is that she was framed. So... If we go to the opening statements, when they did their opening statements, this is what it was. So, Miss Reed, she pleads guilt, not guilty to second-degree murder. Prosecution says she hit her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, with her vehicle outside of a home in Canton during a snowstorm on January 29th, 2022. The defense, in their opening statement, their theory of the case is essentially um, that she was framed. Her car never struck John O'Keefe. She didn't know she did not cause his death. And that means that somebody else did it. And, you know, it's not their responsibility to do this, but the defense never offered an alternative of who killed Mr. O'Keefe. Their theory of the case is that perhaps John O'Keefe found his way into the house that they were visiting, walked up and down three flights of stairs in the house, and was assaulted by the people that were in there or somebody inside of the house. They don't know specifically who, but he had beef with the officer with the officers in there and they beat him up and stuck him outside and left him for dead and try to get Karen Reed to take the fall. Now, normally when I hear a story like that, I mean, isn't it true that that's basically the, the story of every defendant who's ever stood trial and 
fought for their freedom. Oh, it wasn't me. I know that there's evidence against me, but I was framed. It was planted. Well, the deeper that you got into this case, um, it's not completely bull to, to think. Dominic, edit that out. It's not completely BS to think that um, that she may have been framed. Uh, the defense in their pleadings in some of their pretrial motions have alluded to the fact that this is a department-wide conspiracy. Uh, certain people were fond of other people, were protecting other people, and this whole web of lies ensued, which resulted in faulty uh, investigation, uh, planted evidence, um, people hiding text messages, people doing all kinds of stuff. And the, the closer you got into it was, hey, perhaps Karen was not responsible for this. And I did a couple of videos on this case prior to trial starting. And I simply stated, we got to wait to see how this evidence is going to come out. Because if what the defense is saying is true, then the prosecution has a lot of holes that they have to fill. And... I kind of reserved my judgment as far as um, whether I believed Miss Reed is guilty or not, because I wanted to see how the evidence is played out. But I got to say, if you're grading the trial performance of the prosecution right now, they're probably like at a D plus. But I say that they're probably fine. The problem is the defense team of Miss Reed is doing an astoundingly good job of poking holes in all of the state's witnesses and raising reasonable doubt. They, what state is this on this? Oh, we are in Boston. Okay. No, Mass. Massachusetts. Yes. Um, the Commonwealth, if you will. And so all of the witnesses so far have been assaulted by the defense attorney's cross-examination. Um, and I'm not impressed so far with the prosecution's case. I got to say that. And if you believe in primacy and recency, and that's the way as lawyers were taught to present trial, and I've just finished a trial yesterday, um, and so I'm kind of very much of that mode, the prosecution right now has fallen flat. Just glancing at the landscape of everybody that's paying attention to this case. Um, what is Pokey on about? She says, where am I? Who am I? Who are the who's my boyfriend? What? I'm going home as soon as I find out who I... I don't know what Pokey is on. <laughs> she, that, 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 that's a first one? She's raising a ruckus in the comments. What's up, Jenny from Colorado? Lulu, of course. She's our, I think she might be our number one fan from Detroit, Michigan. She was a, well. One of my best friends lives in Michigan. Uh, I've been to Michigan for, uh, gosh, back in the 90s for a wrestling tournament. When you were living in Ohio? Um, I think I just moved. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's recap the first day of evidence. So the first person to jump on the stand or one of the, I'm not going to do these in order. I'm just going to basically run through the list of witnesses and what they had to say. So Stephen Seraf testified about the scene, about the footprints, about Reed's behavior at the location. Um, his testimony uh, basically described a situation that when he arrived at the scene on Fairview Road in Canton, he mentioned that, of course, snowy conditions, that's been pretty well known, the presence of individuals, including Reed and O'Keefe. Um, he mentioned, he testified about Reed's behavior, um, testified about observing Karen Reed giving CPR to O'Keefe upon his arrival. He described her as being visibly upset, stating that she expressed guilt and distress, claiming responsibility for the situation. Um, he talked about there were footprints and track marks, uh, noting the presence of footprints and track marks around O'Keefe's body, but mentioned that none of them were leading from the residence. This detail kind of suggests movement around the body, but not a direct connection with the house. That's why it was important for the prosecution to get that in. Um, Seraph Men, I'm not sure if you pronounce the name Seraph or Seraph, uh, but he mentioned that there were interactions with other women present at the scene who provided information about the circumstances leading up to O'Keefe's condition, including drinking at bars downtown. Um, he described O'Keefe's state upon his arrival, indicating that he couldn't find a pulse, 
Uh, O'Keefe was cold to the touch and appeared to have injuries consistent with a serious incident. Now, we've talked about the injuries that Mr. O'Keefe had, whether or not they were consistent with being hit by a car and left for dead in the snow. And that was one of the most problematic things for the prosecution's case because it kind of looked like the guy, if you believe what the defense was saying, had been in a fight. Um, I forget specifically what the injuries were, but there was claw marks on his arm, like he'd been a tra- attacked by a dog, was the uh, was one of the theories. Um, he looked like he had been in a fight. He had bruising on his knuckles. Um, they had we were careful to mention that one of the individuals in the house was a trained boxer um, and that he was maybe assaulted by two or three people, including a dog. But his injuries, there's no way that you get the injuries that they knew of that he had sustained by being hit by a car. And so that was one of the holes that the prosecution had to, mm-hmm. to kind of fix. So there they are. Mr. Srav gets on there and he, he says that. Aaron O'Keefe, who is John O'Keefe's sister-in-law, um, was there to talk about, give insights into relationships, arguments, um, and the events leading up to O'Keefe's death. Now, this is very important. So um, to what degree? I don't know. Second degree, I don't think that anybody really believes that Karen Reed, if she was guilty, intended to do what she is alleged to have done. I don't think anybody believes that she purposely ran him over. The narrative that the prosecution is basically running with is, yeah, maybe she didn't try to kill him, but she was being reckless and she ran him over and maybe she didn't know she did or or maybe she did and just kind of forgot. But they go through a, a great deal of trouble to talk about the relationship dynamics Um, specifically Aaron O'Keefe. So she described the relationship between Karen and John. Uh, She detailed how Reed had spent time at O'Keefe's house, uh, mentioned their interactions during trips and daily uh, daily routines, uh, family arrangements. Uh, She had discussed that there were, um, that John O'Keefe was the legal guardian of his niece and nephew. After their parents had passed away, she highlighted that family dynamic, including interactions with Karen and their living arrangements. Um, She described interactions with Karen. Uh, She provided accounts of Karen's presence in their lives, discussing issues and occasional disputes between Reed and John. And I think that what she was basically alluding to was the fact that John was spending so much time raising these kids that it kind of took away from her relationship with John. If there was anything that was negative that came out of that that testimony, that would have been the one thing. Um, she talked about the days leading up to John's death, including uh, trips, arguments that might that have occurred between Karen and John. Um, she offered a perspective on Reed's behavior, um, helping to paint a picture that maybe it wasn't, you know, exactly paradise in their relationship. And that was it. She was basically an, a nothing witness. Um, Lulu says it looked staged. Uh, the crime scene. Yeah, 100% agree. Jen H. She talks, she's talking about the Apple watch stuff is what makes me think every, uh, is makes me rethink everything at this point. You mentioned in the previous show, um, will this be, oh yeah, that's going to come in Jen for sure. Um, if it hasn't already, I haven't watched every single day of trial, but there's going to be a discussion about the Apple watch data. Because the prosecution's theory is that John never entered the house. The Apple Watch data seems to say that not only did he go into the house, but he was running up and down the stairs um, through three flights of stairs. Oh, the steps. Yeah. Um, Prosecution's going to have to address that at some point because the defense is 100% going to bring that up. Of course. Yeah. So Paul, John's younger brother, gets on the stand. He talks about, again, he's just talking about interactions between himself, Karen, plans before the incident, his description of the scene. He talks about the relationship between Karen and his brother. Um, he shared insights about how they met, their interactions, blah, blah, blah. Um, most importantly, he talked about leading up to the incident. Paul um, basically describing interactions between Karen and John, including arguments over finances, disagree- disagreements over child rearing practices, you know, all normal stuff, nothing too insignificant, nothing that you would run over a guy for. Um, again, I'm a little confused as to why the prosecution is focusing in on this. If they're not charging her with first degree murder, all they have to prove is that she accidentally ran him over. 
Um, or in the, well, I guess it's kind of true. I understand. So, all right. I'm correcting myself. Normally on the, uh, when we're not doing a live show, I would tell Dominic, editing moment. <laughs> so the fact she's charged with second degree murder, the distinction is that she purposely killed John. That's why they're bringing up the relationship dynamics. They're trying to say that maybe in a fit of rage, whether or not it was logical for her to do it or not. Oh, that was premeditated? You're no, premeditated is first degree. Second degree is spur of the moment. I get so oh, okay. pissed off. I get what you're saying. Like you walk in on your husband um, sleeping with a maid or something, and then in a fit of rage, you pick up uh, a, knife. a lead pipe or whatever, weapon of choice, and, um, and you do something. Act in the heat of the moment. That's a second okay. degree murder. murder. So what they're trying to paint this as is, is, is Karen was so pissed off uh, because of all of the stuff building up that she uh, floored it in reverse and ran him over and just gone, mm -hmm. right? The underlying charge of that would be um, an unintentional homicide mm -hmm. or a negligent homicide or reckless homicide, which is kind of more or, or less what this looks like without more because the testimony that's come out does not lend itself to, oh, she was definitely, uh, because he's raising these kids, taking away time from the relationship. That's definitely um, an intentional act. There's nothing so far that leads me to believe that specifically. Um, Miss Dark Humor, Miss Dark Humor, I love the name, um, is the defense going to bring in their own, oh, of course they are, uh, their own witnesses, and are they some of the ones that have already testified? No, they're probably not going to bring in anybody that testifies for the prosecution because they're cross-examining them. Did they already say how long are they going to take the This trial? is probably a two-month trial, six weeks. So we should talk about the judge in this case. So... Melissa. You did a background on the judge? No, I've ob observed her during some of the pretrial motions. Okay. She is like one of my least favorite kinds of judges. So I don't know your experience with judges, but I've been practicing for 10 years. This is more an apt question for Ileana, who's ill with her child, probably has pink eye or something. Um, but she is, hey, it's a thing. You got, you got kids. I didn't say anything. Um, this judge seems to not want to be bothered with the defense's motions. So there's been dozens of motions that have been filed in this case. And there has been some talk about whether or not maybe we should change judges because the judge seems to be really pissed off at the defense because of all the stuff they, they keep on bringing up. Like, for example, one of the pretrial motions was they wanted to change the courtroom because it was a violation of his constitutional rights that he couldn't. Uh, get a proper angle of the witness and, you know, the confrontation clause and all those kinds of things. The legal aspects of it are not important, but it was a legitimate point that the defense brought up and the judge just looked so irritated at her. And normally when we see these high profile judges, you don't see judges react like that. I can think of a couple of examples, um, like the Parkland case, that one judge that yelled at the, the public defender. Um, Parkland but, case was the one in Florida? Yeah, it was a Florida case. It was um, at the sentencing hearing. But before I get too off track, uh, most judges in these high profile cases that are telephized, that are subject of national scrutiny, are on their best behavior. So if this judge is acting like this now under this spotlight, imagine what she would be like practicing in just like regular everyday practice. Mm -hmm. And so she's she is something to be reckoned with in this case. Of course, she had to be a woman. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. Well, there's literally no distinction between men and women when it comes to judges. I have not, I don't know if I would say that male judges are more um, impulsive than female judges or more apt to displays of anger. I've, I've honestly seen an equal amount of both. Mm -hmm. it's, just the, it's just the power of sitting in that position that causes people to react in uh, stereotypical ways. Um. My short experience in front of judges, which has been very limited to none. <laughs> well, you got to testify in the trial that I just did. Yes. How was that? <laughs> well, that judge was the sweetest judge yeah. that there is in San Bernardino. You got off easy she with that She is one. so sweetheart. She smiled at me the entire time. She made me feel so, so, like, secure and confident of myself. Yeah. But that experience is something I really wish I do not have to repeat because I was so nervous. Well, that's what happens. Do you realize that I'm only halfway through day one? Whose bright idea was it to recap two weeks of trial on a live stream? All right, I got to get through this somehow. Let's, let's continue. So O'Keefe, 
he testified about the last communication with uh, his brother, which included plans to meet on a specific day, events that led to the cancellation of their get-together due to inclement weather. Uh, the information helps establish a timeline, basically leading up to the incident. And then he talks about, after the incident, um, describing Karen's behavior um, at the, and presence at the scene. Um, following, He basically shared um, that, you know, she was kind of out of it. Um, she was distraught, whatever. Um, he talks about, some again, some of the family dynamics. Again, nothing too um, juicy, um, which I don't know why you would start with these witnesses. These are middle of the day. This, this is like three weekend witnesses. If you got a six-week presentation, I would introduce these witnesses maybe in you know, week three. But the prosecution is choosing to do it. I feel like they're just maybe just doing it linear. Like there was no forethought into like a primacy and recency. What's our best points? How do we hit these points? How do we hit the, um, how, how are we going to finish? If you're prepping a trial and you've done these before and, you know, like I feel like the defense would not have started with these witnesses, but they didn't. Here we are. They're just falling flat. They're talking about nothing. They're putting the jury to sleep um, with these points. It's like, okay, so they had a relationship. There was something with, about the kids and, you know, leading up to it, behavior, whatever, fine. Um, I need somebody to drop a hammer on day one. Um, Michael Proctor, one of the troopers, um, made claims about uh, the actions and statements of Karen Reed. So the alleged biases and actions, there was claims made during the trial on investigation that might have indicated that Trooper Proctor had deep ties to certain individuals involved in the case. That was something that was attacked by the defense because remember what their theory is they're wanting to prove a conspiracy they're wanting they're wanting to prove that the conspiracy is based on personal ties between the parties of this case who may have been responsible that aren't currently charged and a internal cover-up and mind you there was a whole um fbi investigation which you don't know about i understand um but there was an entire investigation that, to my understanding, is still ongoing, where the FBI made certain conclusions about this case. But one of the things that they were looking for is possible collusion within the police departments um, and possible witness tampering, evidence tampering, some of those kinds of things. So when Michael Proctor gets on there, of course, the cross-examination, um, the defense team is going to try to, to bury themselves into that theory. Um, they talked about his interaction with the witnesses, potential suspects, individuals connected to the case, any preconceived notions, communications, or actions taken by Proctor that could have been questioned uh, for their impact on the case. They talked about his handling of evidence, um, if he was involved in the collection, preservation, or handling of evidence. Um, his testimony regarding these aspects is, is important because um, when you have one of these cases where you're claiming somebody was framed, and it's not just with this case. In every criminal defense case ever, the first thing you attack is the investigation. How could you possibly have concluded that my guy is responsible? Why didn't you look at person A, B, or C when all of this other stuff? Did you ask these questions? Did you think to look under the, 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 the covers? Did you think to do? You know, it's always this. Defense attorneys and law enforcement have this relationship where every time uh, they get on the stand to be questioned in testimony, it's like, hey, why didn't you do your job better? And so that's just the nature of it. And this is really uh, no different in this case. Uh, they had talked to various emergency responders and they just basically tried to establish um, what they would have done on their arrival. They talked again about Karen's behavior, which is pretty consistent so far. Um, they talked about their initial action, Karen Reed's statements about things that she said, collaboration with law enforcement. Again, they were trying to um, dive into that, how they handled the scene. Um, and so that was it. That was kind of what they did. What I feel happened in day one more than anything else is the defense getting in their theory about consistent with their opening statement about this was an internal cover up. And that there are things that were done in this case that are not consistent with how you would have reacted in any other case. And then we go into day two. And we, on day two, they had talked to Canton Fire Lieutenant Anthony Flamati. He gave testimony about the snowy conditions at the scene, about how Karen Reed was performing chest compressions on the victim when firefighters arrived. Uh, they talked to Timothy Nuttall, uh, who uh, talked about the condition of the victim 
They talked to um, Stephen Mullaney, who described the initial scene upon his arrival. And I guess they talked to Steve Seraph again. Um, as far as the snowy conditions, uh, Flamati had mentioned that there were four to six inches of snow on the ground when they received the call. And he emphasized the challenging weather conditions at the time of the incident. So that's kind of a big deal because the snowfall, I've heard a lot of floating theories out there in the case. Some were suggesting that the iPhone was found under like inches of snow. Some are suggesting that it was like found on top of the snow, um, indicating possible placement of evidence, that kind of a thing. So the conditions of how everything was found is pretty important. So they go into it. They talked about his actions and she was actively giving, according to Flamati, uh, chest compressions, trying to do CPR on O'Keefe because she was, you know, she was basically distraught. She was acting like a person that did not want to her boyfriend to die. Regardless of whether or not they were fighting, regardless of whether or not there was anything going on in the relationship, she was actively trying to save him. You've heard Karen Reed um, in press conferences uh, not that long ago saying, look, I'm not the one who did this. I was the one trying to save him. And so they're getting this out. Um, they paused proceedings at this point. Um, and then they go on to Timothy Nuttall. And he just talked about, uh, again, some of the same stuff. Stephen Mullaney testified uh, that, uh, oh, what did I do with this? Oh, here it goes. He talked about Karen Reed's reaction. I mentioned her emotional state recounting her screaming about the victim's identity and his status. Um, he was reflecting on uh, the atmosphere. He talked about the police response, that dispatchers were advised that Karen Reed was making suicidal statements, prompting officers to ensure her safety and well-being during the incident. Um, the defense kind of pushed back a little bit on that. They were trying to indicate, how could you possibly have known that? What was interesting is... Um, I think it was on day five, another witness had talked about how they heard Karen making these suicidal statements, but then they introduced video to him. It's like, oh, how could you have possibly heard that when you were such and such a distance away and you were actively performing emergency services on Mr. O'Keefe yourself? He's like, oh, I guess I was. Um, basically laying the foundation that, okay, this is what we're going to say. Everybody's going to get here and we're all going to say the same thing. Karen's distraught. She's making suicidal ideations to everybody suggesting that she knows what she just did and maybe she's starting to sober up and uh, she's making these suicidal threats because she knows what's coming, which is she's guilty of murder, which is the prosecution's theory. Defense is like, hold up, hold the phone on all of that. You know, where's this coming from? Um, they talked about clearing of evidence, uh, that about how one of the officers used a leaf blower to clear snow around the scene for evidence collection demonstrating efforts to maintain the integrity of the investigative process, it which looks is like they're trying so hard to incriminate her. Like so, so hard. Now you're saying that as a lay person, which is interesting. What do you think about any, but okay. You know enough about evidence collection in our cases to know that you're super careful with the evidence. You don't touch anything. You need everything as is documented. Like, especially the crime scene, you treat it like an archaeological site. Mm -hmm. They brought out a freaking leaf blower and were blowing snow around. Um, how do you know there wasn't evidence in that snow? How do you know there wasn't remnants of blood? How do you know there wasn't DNA? How do you know that there wasn't some kind of other incriminating evidence? You don't know what you don't know. They're using a leaf blower to kind of clear the area, um, and it's problematic. It's, you don't tamper with evidence. Well, this basically. isn't tampering. That's just being negligent. And then the question becomes, is it negligent because you're dumb or is it negligent because it was on purpose? You know, see what I'm getting at? And so um, that was, well, going into day three, you kind of see the defense um, as. Now I see why you're telling me that they're doing such a horrendous job. Well, number one, it's the order of witnesses that I don't like. I don't understand what points they're trying to make. So they make this statement about how she's guilty of uh, running him over with the car. Mm -hmm. And they're starting with these witnesses. They're kind of talking about haphazardly their, their, the relationship, family dynamics. Um, that has nothing to do with what actually happened. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're trying to find something like maybe they could have started with uh, the, uh, the voicemail about how she says, I effing hate you. And I never, I don't remember verbatim what she said, but it was something along those lines. Something along those lines. 
I would have started with that. And then um, I would have possibly started with, uh, you know, what would be the motive? I would have started with uh, maybe the alcohol consumption, maybe start with the bartender. How much was she drinking? Um, but for them to start with these rather mundane something uh, with a little witnesses. Bit, something a little bit closer to what happened, to when it happened. I mean, it's all when it happened. It's just the, 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 the framing of it all. Yeah, they're starting like in an odd timeline. That's what you're trying to tell me. It's weird, yeah. Hey, Dominic, how far are we in on this show? Uh, we are about 34 minutes. 34? Wow. Oh. oh, we're not that bad. We're not wow. doing that bad. All right, so let's go on to day three. So on day three, um, paramedics had come in to testify that Karen Reed admitted to hitting her boyfriend during the trial. That's an important. Why don't we start with that? Why is day three testimony on day three? That That's probably what they should have led with. Her admissions to the paramedics about how she hit her husband. Um, her husband, her boyfriend. Um, I've been reading this book about the art of storytelling. Um, uh, the author of uh, Moneyball, I can't think of his name right now. Um, but one of the things he talks about in storytelling, which fits my theories of primacy and recency, is that you start with a narrative, you know, uh, there, there's a way to frame it. And if you're framing this with one of the witnesses, maybe the opening line of this story that you're telling is her recitations to the paramedics about, oh my God, I hit Mr. O'Keefe. I killed him. I killed him. I killed him. That's what they've said. Maybe you start with that. And then in the jury's mind, you put them there and she's admitting to it. And now right off the bat, you don't have to think too hard much now. She, didn't she just admit it? So why are we doing this trial? And mind you, the jurors are not supposed to know anything about this case, not have followed it locally, which is difficult to do over there in Boston, Massachusetts, especially a case like this that's gained so much renown. But you have to put something in the jury's mind that is obviously she's guilty. What are we doing here? To me, that's what you would have started with. They chose to start with, uh, I don't know, um, the most boring witnesses you could possibly think of. Those witnesses really were, are not worth anything. This reminds me of Johnny and Amber's case. It was like six weeks also of trial where supposedly the jury was not supposed to look at social media or anything outside. And it was like super hard because everywhere they were slamming information of the case. Well, it's yeah. You have to sequester jury sometimes and like that's that's a whole... You don't ever want to be in a sequestered jury. That sucks. They put you in a hotel. They they steal your internet. You know, you're allowed to watch. They block everything, I know. Yeah, it sucks. Um, I think you're not even allowed in some cases to speak to people outside. No, not about the case. No. About anything else, just not about the case. Uh, all right, so day three. Here are the main takeaways. Two paramedics confirmed that Karen Reed admitted she hit her boyfriend. There was video footage that was used to question their paramedics' accounts during cross-examination by the defense. They did a brilliant job of cross-examination. Um, the two paramedics were Katie McLaughlin, Anthony, Anthony Flamati, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, the judge had tried to implement a buffer zone around the courthouse because there was stuff going on. Um, there was uh, some motions that were decided. Um, but... Essentially, the, the testimony was this. McLaughlin testified that Karen Reed said, I hit him. This admission by Reed regarding the incident was, uh, again, what they should have started with. Um, she said that she repeated it several times. Uh, she repeated the statement um, over and over and over again. She acted distraught, according to McLaughlin, um, implying that, you know, she was emotionally distraught. Uh, potentially because she knew that she was guilty of murder, I guess would have been the implication. The response of law enforcement, she did mention a little bit about that, noting that an officer had signaled for another individual, likely a sergeant, after Reed had repeated her admission, um, indicating that they were now putting her into primary suspect mode. Let's go pull her aside and start interrogating her. Anthony Flamati gets on the stand, um, testified that he also heard Karen confess at the scene, and she said, I hit him, I hit him, oh my God, I hit him. Um, he, but on cross-examination, the defense and the brilliance of their cross-examination so far, um, they questioned his ability to hear what Reed was saying while he was performing aid. Now look, 
you could very well be performing CPR on somebody, doing chest compressions, uh, maybe doing, I don't know, whatever you can, some vigorous thing, um, and hear somebody in the background shouting stuff. I do it all the time. Matter of fact, when I'm um, in trial, I could hear in the background stuff that's going on, you know, if it's loud enough or pronounced enough or important enough. And so the, the fact um, that he asked that question is not all that important because, of course, he could explain it away. And in redirect, the prosecution did try to do that. Um, the point is the jurors are going to have those questions just enough, just enough. And remember what the, what the, uh, what the goal is. What, what is the North Star of the defense? Raise reasonable doubts. And so here they question him, how is it possible that you heard her say those things um, while you're performing aid? And the answer, of course, is because she was screaming it, sir. It was kind of, I'm not deaf. I have ears. They work even when I'm doing stuff, you know, especially if it's out of the ordinary. Could easily have explained that away. But it was a question. Um, Flamati testified that he heard Karen make the confession. She said that. I asked her if there had been any significant trauma that happened before this. And McLaughlin said that she said, I hit him. I repeated it. Uh, she repeated it one more time. McLaughlin. Oh, I'm on McLaughlin. Apologize. I'm, I'm mixing up my notes here. Um, Flamati had testified that he heard those confessions. But during cross, Reed's attorney, Alan Jackson, who is a brilliant attorney, I don't know how many times I could say that, showed jurors a three-minute video clip of what appeared to be Flamati giving O'Keefe chest compressions and questioned how he could have heard Reed while providing first aid. And then Flamati acknowledged that he had not seen uh, that video that they were talking about. And that was it. Um, moving on to day four. Oh, just Jules says, Omar and Ileana. Um, Ileana's not here today, Jules. It's just, uh, it's just Melissa. <laughs> She's here um, staring at me blankly as I'm going over this, uh, this uh, trial recap. She says, I'm so freaking glad that you guys are doing this case. Yeah, this is a crazy one. Um, all right, so day... Let me regain my... I think they're on day nine. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just getting through the first week. Uh, so on day four, the key takeaways was there were more witnesses that testified about Reed's distressed behavior and statements. Uh, there were conflicting statements regarding whether Reed had admitted hitting her boyfriend. Um, there were statements about how Reed's mood had fluctuated. Um, there was a lot of things. The witnesses that testified was Jason Becker, Daniel Whitley, Greg Woodbury, Katie McLaughlin. I think that we're finishing up with her. So Jason Becker, his testimony, that's where we left off. Again, he describes Reed as being cooperative um, and that she was repeatedly asking O'Keefe if she was dead. Uh, Becker mentions that she had, a, uh, she had blood on her face and neck area and was making su suicidal statements, um, although we had noted that she had no plan to act on these statements, according to him. Um, the blood on the face is obviously because she was trying to render CPR to the guy, chest that's compressions and all say. of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not significant for no. anything. Um, Reed had expressed concern about who's going to take care of O'Keefe's niece and nephew. Uh, Becker noted that uh, Reed's mood fluctuated during their interaction, which is important because if your mood fluctuates, it suggests that you are forcing emotions. It suggests that you are um, making it up on the fly. It suggests that similar to, um, you know, when you talk to a kid and they don't want to eat their vegetables, like, oh, I can't, my stomach hurts and everything else. And then you get them out of the situation. Oh, and then they start playing with their my daughters just did this the other day. My mind is <laughs> on toddlers right now. Okay, but that's a child. But I mean, I would. But you see it with guilty folks all the time. Like, for example, in the trial that I just did, perfect example, um, on direct examination, they're perfect angels and everything. Then when I get on them on cross-examination, all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, yeah, that might have happened. I don't remember exactly. But they had perfect recall when they were being questioned by their attorney. Now I'm questioning them on cross-examination. Don't you remember when they scheduled court on such and such a day? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not sure. Well, the judge was here when 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 you said it. You heard the judge say it. You were sitting right there. It's like, oh, I don't really pay attention to the dates. Right. And so the point is they're trying to make her look like she was trying to put something on with her expressions. Um, he observed that Reed had periods of calmness. 
uh, but also became agitated at times, naturally, uh, particularly when she didn't want to go to the hospital. Um, I wouldn't blame her mood swings, if I could say it that way. Well, I mean... If you just underwent a traumatic Don't think about yourself right now. Think about yourself when you're hungover in Vegas. Now, you just took a trip to Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. Or last weekend. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, you don't have to tell me, but I'm sure that there's... Well, just put yourself when you're drinking. It's 3, 4, 5 in the morning. Um, You're probably starting to feel a little hungover. Maybe you got a headache. Maybe you're agitated. But you realize that there was some physical crazy thing that just happened. Hey, your boyfriend is dead. Um, and you're sobering up as everything's going on. That's a lot to process. That's a lot of things happening at the same time. Yeah. And so what you could take away from her behavior in that moment, as long as she's not giving inconsistent statements. And that's the one thing that's been consistent in this case throughout is that Karen Reed has not been inconsistent from the day that she was investigated. I have not heard any reports and it hasn't come out in testimony that she was saying one thing and then another. Everything was like a progression of a realization, like, oh, my God, uh, we're having a good time with our with our, my boyfriend. We're out with friends. We're drinking. Um, I'm leaving the party because I'm getting frustrated. Uh, John's not coming out. And then I think she goes home. She goes to bed. And then where's my boyfriend? And, oh, my God, is he dead? Did I hit him? Did, you know, did I do something? Trying to recall genuinely what happened. Um, And I don't know how people are going to take that. I don't know how the jury is taking that. And all that evidence hasn't even really been fully fleshed out in this trial. But I think that her fluctuations in behavior, if that's what they're focusing on, is not where they're going to score points in this case. Maybe it will. I don't know. But in my opinion, um, not really. On cross, when uh, Becker was crossed, uh, there was a sidebar. And then defense attorney Yannetti shows Becker uh, the reports from lead investigator Michael Proctor. Becker said that he told Proctor on February 14th that Reed had said she consumed alcohol the night before O'Keefe's death. And then Yannetti also asked Becker if Reed's speech was rapid, if it was, if she was fixated uh, on whether O'Keefe was dead, and then he answered in the affirmative both times. Um, he zeroed in on Becker's statement about Reed had denied taking drugs or alcohol that day. He says, you would agree that she did tell you at some point that she had alcohol the night before, correct? Becker says, no. Uh, citing ba- uh, Becker's statement to the case, lead investigator on February 14th, Yanetti asked if Reed had said she hadn't taken drugs, but acknowledged she did consume some alcohol last night. And then he goes into the whole thing. Um, Canton firefighter Daniel Whitley uh, goes in there to testify, uh, Reed being upset, again, expressing concerns about O'Keefe's niece, um, just kind of corroborating some of the other stuff. On cross-examination, Whitley was asked about whether or not he knew about Karen Reed's medical history, uh, which led to a referral to a co-worker's report confirming Reed's uh, MS diagnosis. Um, he questioned Whitley about Reed's behavior and mood during the ambulance ride to the hospital, focusing on her statements about caring for O'Keefe. Um, there were inquiries about Reed's distress, reluctance to go to the hospital, concerns about her ability to care for the children. Uh, Whitley had questioned about Reed's interactions with him during the ambulance ride, where the mood shifted from being emotional to asking him about uh, to asking about Carrie Roberts in a seemingly disconnected manner. Um, really, it, it's almost like a cumulative witness at this point. Mm-hmm. There's not a whole lot of points being scored there. Um, Greg Woodbury goes in again to testify about what he observed, uh, mentions assisting with CPR at the scene, describing O'Keefe's physical condition, including bruising over his right eye. So this is important. He was hit by a car. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you get hit with the car um, and have the injuries that he has? So this is the first time that we're starting to get to what was his injuries. injuries. Yeah, so there was bruising over his right eye, scratches on his forearm. Now, I've seen pictures of those scratches. Dominic's going to put a uh, a, a, um, flash a picture of those injuries. Um, But it looked like he was clawed at by an animal. You know, Mm -hmm. what was that about? So you're not going to get that. I don't care how. I can't imagine how you could be backed into and have the scratch marks. And they were fresh injuries. And their theory of the case is that, you know, he was beaten up in the house and attacked by a dog. Um, So the prosecution has to explain these injuries. Um, Woodbury highlights, again, he talks about her emotional state, her behavior. 
Um, he discussed a Section 12 response for Reed, indicating that she made threats against her life, stating she didn't want to go, she didn't want to live anymore. Um, if her husband had died, um, wasn't her husband, but that's what he said. Um, he described the emotional fluctuations again. Um, on cross, uh, it, it was a lot of the same stuff. How could you know this and that, whatever? Um, it wasn't really that eventful of a day. So a lot of the week one stuff was just really just kind of setting the stain, uh, basically building the timeline. And that's just kind of the way that they're doing. They're doing it in a very linear fashion. Um, week two was a little more eventful because they started talking about the Red Cup stuff. Now, I know you have not watched this trial, but I have never in my life heard another officer say that they put evidence in a red cup because they thought that it wasn't that big of a deal. There were severe um, questions as to, as to chain of custody evidence, um, regardless of whether or not this was a frame job or not. The utter incompetence about how they collected the evidence is already raising red flags with this jury. I promise you, it's utterly ridiculous. Let's get to the recap. So, what did they put in a red cup? Evidence. We'll get. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, it was basically blood samples, um, among other things. Uh, there was Katie McLaughlin. They accused her of perjury, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But they. They were basically challenging their collection methods, including blood samples and crime scene processing in the, in the snow. Remember the, the, the wind blower? Um, the testimony was that it was a chaotic scene. There was a lot of stuff going on, lack of protocols and evidence handling. Um, there was more stuff about Karen Reed's distress, conflicting reports about uh, her admission of hitting the victim. Um, I think it was Paul Gallagher. So here's what he said. Paul Gallagher testified that he was in charge of preserving the crime scene where O'Keefe was found. He receives a call about O'Keefe being found unresponsive in the snow. Gallagher describes the unique challenges of processing the scene due to snowy weather, whatever. They use a leaf blower to clear the snow, the area, whatever. Um, he mentioned finding pink spots in the snow, which were to believe to be blood. And they collected those blood samples using plastic cups to prevent contamination. Why is that important? Because what if those blood samples contain DNA from, let's just assume that the guy was beaten up inside the house, right? Um, to the degree where he's injured enough to be left for dead in a snowy night in Boston, Massachusetts. What if some of those blood spatter in the snow belong to the DNA of some of the other individuals in the house? What if... The point being, if there was any other DNA other than Mr. O'Keefe's that was collected in the blood, it wouldn't have been from Karen. She didn't even get out the car, I don't think. At least it hasn't come out so far. I mean, doing CPR and all that kind of stuff, maybe. Um, there's a lot of questions. And look, there's, there's not really a, a, a stone-cold way to do it. I'm just stating that the way that they collected the, the evidence— uh, is problematic, and the defense did a really good job of following up on that. Uh, there, he talked about the examination of Karen's SUV. Uh, they discussed um, the examination of her SUV, uh, which prosecutors had alleged was obviously that they hit him. There was video of the vehicle being examined that was shown to the jurors. Um, under cross-examination, he was questioned, Gallagher was, about the lack of a written report. Why didn't you guys write a report regarding his role in the case and the absence of diagrams, which would normally be um, readily made in the file, made available in the file, showing the exact location of evidence, uh, like the cocktail glass um, and blood spots, because there's some indication that, well, either he, uh, she hit him with a cocktail glass and there's remnants of it or whatever, or she hit him with a the car. There's multiple theories, right? Um, and nothing of that has been popped up in exhibits? Well, not so far. As a matter of fact, they're talking about to Gallagher about why you didn't take certain measures to collect this evidence. Mm -hmm. um, Gallagher mentions that it was the first time he had processed a crime scene in the snow and used a leaf blower for this purpose. He also clarified that uh, procedures followed were improvised due to the inclement weather, which I find really hard to believe in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston? Parentheses. If somebody would tell me that here in California, okay, I get you. But over there, I think it rains like 
93% of the year. Something along those lines. You have, in Boston, admittedly, I've never been to Boston. But inclement weather is a thing out there. You yeah, know, it's, it's super common. There, in my 43 years of when life. When did this happen? When was the date of the crime? Uh, January 29th, 2022. Okay. It was in Plain January. winter. Well, either way. The fact that they didn't have protocols in place That's to deal with a snowy crime scene is ludicrous and astonishing that this effing guy would jump on the witness stand and confidently just declare that, which suggests to me a couple of things. Lack of witness preparation. For one. Um, and for two, utter incompetence on the part of this guy. Um, but it also may be, you know, a blessing to the prosecution because, look, it's not that she was being framed. It's just that this guy was an idiot. You know, they're going to have to eventually just come to grips that, yeah, look, maybe there's some things he could have done better. Of course, there's protocol for how to handle um, crime Sorry, scenes in the snow. I guarantee you um, in the defense's case in chief, they're going to introduce witnesses who will testify. Oh, yeah, we got def we certainly have protocol. Would you ever use a leaf blower to... Uh, investigate a crime scene to clear out snow absolutely not because of whatever reason would you ever collect blood samples and place them in a red solo cup the kind that you have at these uh parties college parties or whatever uh, no that's retarded we put it in a in a sterilized baggie so that they're preserved chain of custody and we would document all of these things this more, guy didn't even write a report more so let's that's a crime scene, but even in hospitals and other places where you have to give lab samples for your blood or stools or anything, you're required to put them in a sterilized cup that the hospital gives you. And if you put them in something else, they're like, nope, contaminate it. Objection, Your Honor. This witness is not qualified to be making those statements. Sustained. Thank you. I apologize. I'm in trial mode. Um, but I, I, I know your point. I know what you're, the point you're making. Um, because yeah, that's just pretty much common sense. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why I'm keep saying trying so hard to frame her so hard. We're going to leave off also oh, estimations and measurements. So Gallagher was queried about how the locations of evidence like the glass and the blood spots were identified at the scene. And Jackson said, um, uh, he pointed out that without measurements taken that those locations were estimates or guesses and basically uh, pointing the jury to the unreliability of whatever was in um, what came from this police investigation, right? Um, Gallagher was asked by the defense about the improvisational nature of the evidence collection process, especially in snowy conditions. And then again, he highlights the leaf blower in the cups. Um, Gallagher asked, uh, was asked about uh, the absence of certain evidence. He confirmed that certain pieces of evidence, like a shoe or broken taillight, were not found by him on the scene. Important because he was one of the first persons to investigate the crime scene. So if he if he used a leaf blower and he's blowing away snow, um, and they found, I think they said that they found remnants of the taillight like days afterwards. Um, in the same spot where Mr. O'Keefe was. And one of the theories is, oh, well, maybe it was like buried in the snow and the snow melted and that's why they didn't see it. It's like, I don't know. If you're blowing away the the, the snow, you know, I have a leaf blower because I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a dad. I just do. And it does a pretty good job of blowing everything away. Like it's, it's going to catch pieces of a taillight to the point where you're not going to miss it, um, especially if you got headlights focused on it and lights and reflective. Just, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me why they would uh, admit to something like that. Jackson was questioned. Uh, Jackson questioned Gallagher about the handling of uh, certain evidence, including a dirty rag, a grocery bag observed near Reed's SUV. Um, he raised concerns about the potential for cross-examination because, of course, and there was this, this section of testimony where he's like, um, the guy was like, well, I don't know what sterile, what, what definition of sterile you mean. He was asking, so was the cup sterile? Like, well, I'd imagine it would be sterile. I'd imagine they wouldn't be selling non-sterile cups. Um, and then he keeps on pressing the issue. And then one of the words that came out of his mouth was, I guess it depends on the definition of sterile that you mean. And this is a guy handling the evidence. Obviously, sterile means like 
sterile. Sterile. Like no potential for cross examination, uh, no potential, you know, chain of custody. What's his definition? I don't know what his definition. I just think maybe he just means clean. Like, oh, I could just blow on it. It's sterile now. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you can't make this shit up, man. Um, all right. So he was pressed on the absence of protocol. Um, you know, so they scored, the defense scored a lot of points. And this guy, um, Paul Gallagher, just, uh, well, he just kind of crapped the bed there for the, for the prosecutor's case in chief. Um, interesting how they're going to fix that. Let's talk about Sergeant Sean Good. Um, he came in, testified about preserving the crime scene uh, where John O'Keefe was found and the methods used. He again talked about a leaf blower in the snow. He testifies as the shift supervisor on the day of O'Keefe's de death. Um, he details the initial response to the scene interactions with Karen and other individuals. Um, his initial response, he says, Good recalled receiving a 911 call in the early hours of the morning about O'Keefe being found unresponsive in the snow. And he was among the first responders at the scene on Fairview Road. He describes the chaotic scene again, like everybody else had about what was going on. So I think one thing is pretty clear. Here's the image that I'm getting through this repetition of evidence. Crime scene. Um, Karen is not really understanding what's going on. Her boyfriend is laying there dead. She's trying to resuscitate him. And then the first responders get there and they just basically obliterate the crime scene. That's the picture that I would have if I was the jury. A leaf blower, plastic cups. You don't know what sterile means. What are we doing? What? What do you think, Melissa? What is your layperson? Dominic, what do you think of that? Ridiculous. Totally. <laughs> Say it was ridiculous. I don't know if I was if I was the judge and I don't have experience in law school, law, being an attorney, a lawyer, and a uh, judge, anything, but like a lead person, like you just said, if I was the judge, I would have been like, okay, no, I can't do this. No, I can't lead with people so unprofessional. I just think that it was a lack of witness preparation. Listen, I've been, I don't know how many trials I've done in my career. It's probably close to a hundred. I think you already surpassed the hundred. One of the first lessons that I learned as a trial attorney is that if you don't prep your witness for trial, then you are preparing to lose because witnesses, look, they got to know how to testify. They have to know what to say. Not that you're trying to mislead anybody, but they don't have to volunteer information. And what's more is when people are like you, you said, when you testified, Oh, I was so nervous. And you were testifying to stuff that you remembered that you knew. Um, and I've talked to you about your testimony and you presented it to me one way. And when you were in front of the judge, it came out a different way. I had to coax it out of you. And it wasn't that you didn't know what you were talking about. It's just that when you're nervous and everybody's looking at you. Everybody get jinx in your mind. It's different. It's just like. If you don't take the time to prep your witness and let them um, make them comfortable with you, let them know what questions are coming, tell them, look. You can't give a wrong answer. You're just going to be talking about the truth. If you get stuck, don't worry about it. I know what you're wanting to say. I will make sure I ask the right questions. And you and I, matter of fact, I prepped you as my witness. You mm -hmm. got to go through that whole experience. Was that helpful? What if I didn't do that? No. Yeah. I don't even want to imagine what would have happened. I think I would have cried. Because I prepped myself. There is times, and I was nervous. I couldn't even deal to think what would have happened if I would have sat hit that stand and questions were just started to I do remember there was one question that I asked you and then at, we broke for lunch and was like why did you say that it's like I didn't understand what was being asked and I had to fix it on yes. redirect I really did not understand what they were asking me. yeah but you didn't know what you were saying either you couldn't process it I was processing it and it came out a certain way but when the adrenaline is going and the endorphins are rushing and there's everybody looking at you and exactly. the judges yeah it's just a different way to communicate Jules says that uh, my brother uses a leaf blower when we get light, fluffy snow to help out over at my mom's. And if, and it gets a good 95% of it, of, of it, there's like a light layer still, but you can see the driveway. Yeah, for sure. Um, they're framing her. That's what they're doing. I, I don't know if they're framing her yet. There's some compelling evidence that's yet to come out. 
that they're definitely going to get to, but they are not um, doing themselves any favor by... They're not doing a good job. The way that they've investigated this case. Um, just look, the na- if you're trying to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, if the, all the juror has to do is look at the method of how the case evidence was preserved and say, well, that's not reliable. I mean, there's a reasonable doubt. Case is over. Case is over. Um, but, you know, before I spend too much time on that, where was I Where was I on? We talked about Sergeant Good. And, oh, okay. So on cross-examination. Um, what day are we on? Oh, this is day five. Okay. Day five. Uh, there's, again, questions about the handling of evidence. There's just questions about the decision-making process. Um, his responses to the 911 calls um, and the actions that were taken uh, on the information that he received. But basically, that was the main takeaway. We don't have to go any further with that. How are we doing on time, Dominic? We're about an hour and five. An hour? Oh, I got to speed this up. Okay. Uh, Michael Lank. He was interviewed about the jury uh, or without the jury presence to determine the relevancy of his background to his upcoming testimony. Um, But ultimately, this was his background. He provided a background about his role within the police department, his involvement in the investigation. Um, He had talked about biases and relationships and things. Again, he talked about the handling of evidence. Um, He talked about his position as a lieutenant uh, the scrutiny that may have extended to his exercise of discretion and leadership. There wasn't a whole lot there. I think the star, the, the star evidence was red cup guy. That's a, that is, that is one that is going to go down in infamy. Uh, that was the main takeaway. I don't think anybody's going to get their mind off of red cup guy. Um, going on to day six, day six was um, significant. It included, all right. So here they're finally putting us at the bar. Karina, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Kolakathis. Kul- talks about interactions at the bar so who's her going back this is one of the friends they're okay. all they're at the bar that night they're going bar hop, bar, bar hopping hopping bar to bar which i don't know is that a thing that you do bar too hopping old for that you're like 30 exactly i'm too old for that <laughs> i've been too old for that since i was like 25 uh i don't know dominic are you a bar hopper i do occasionally go bar hopping yeah but he's young uh. He's in the flower of his youth. <laughs> Why don't you just like pick a spot and just stick with it? Like, what do you got to go exploring for? Like, you're already there. This sounds like a 21 year old thing. <laughs> I don't know, man. But how old were they? Oh, they, these people are in their 40s, varying ages. Uh, midlife crisis. Yeah. So there's interactions at the bar. Karina testified that Karen and John they appeared to be. So this was significant. They appeared to be affectionate. They appear? Appeared. Like they were being lovey-dovey or whatever, hugging up on each other. They're also pr- pretty blitzed. Everybody's kind of in that state with the appropriate amount of alcohol, sometimes with strangers. But they were being that way with each other. Um, Marina and the guy. No, 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 no. Just talking, about, talking about Karen and O'Keefe. Okay. Uh, there were statements indicating that they were happy, excited about their relationships. Uh, she had mentioned converse, conversations where Reed expressed admiration and love for O'Keefe, particularly for his dedication to his niece and nephew. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also discussed uh, future plans. There was an upcoming trip. There was plans to visit Fairview Road. Um, a mention of a, There was a mention of Jennifer McCabe suggesting a visit to her sister's house on Fairview Road where there was some confusion about who was going where among the group present at the bar. And again, more talk about affectionate behavior. Witnesses observed that Reed and O'Keefe were affectionate at the point where others were noticing and commenting on their loving behavior. And there was some indication that somebody's like, hey, how come you're not like that with me? You know, that kind of thing. So it wasn't just like, it wasn't trivial. I mean, they, they, appeared, they, they appeared to be a happy couple. Um, Karina portrayed Karen as someone who cared for children um, and was open about her relationship with O'Keefe. Uh, there was details about the atmosphere, about the bar interactions among friends and the general mood of the group where, um, where they were celebrating that night. Um, and then there was some indication. Well, before I get into that, 
Nicholas had testified, I know we're running out of time, um, that he mentioned that his arrival at the bar, uh, I think this is Nicholas's, uh, Nicholas's, Karina's husband. She, um, he mentioned his arrival at the bar where they met with friends, including the McCabe's and Albert's on the night of January 28th. He described the atmosphere at the bar as lively. There was a band playing, everyone enjoying themselves. He noted that O'Keefe typically drank beer. Uh, Karen was seen drinking a clear liquid from the glass. That's that's obviously vodka. What other clear alcohols are there? Sake? Tequila. Sometime? Well, yeah. There's another one, mezcal. All right, never mind. <laughs> there, there, there's nothing to get, gain. Yeah, she was drinking some kind of a mixed drink. Um, he talked about relationship dynamics that she testified about, them being infectionate. There was a, a decision to leave. He mentioned that the group discussed moving on to another bar, or to McCabe's sister's house on Fairview, but he ultimately decided to leave with his wife and not join them. Good for him. Um, he said there was no tension. Didn't observe any tension whatsoever between Reed and O'Keefe uh, during their time at the bar, noting that their behavior seemed affectionate and caring. Um, he recalled details about John's, John O'Keefe, his attire, his demeanor at the bar, and it came, there was nothing that seemed out of ordinary that night. Um, and that was it. Just, um, you know, that was the scene. Rebecca Trayer's was the bartender, and this is what she had to say. So she explained, uh, this is at the Waterfall um, water, waterfall Bar. They served beer, wine, and liquor. They had live music on Fridays um, and Saturdays. Their closing time was 12.45 a.m. Seems kind of early. Yeah. You know what blew my mind? So I went from being um, a writer with the spotlight at that uh, hip-hop magazine where I was going to these clubs that were open until like four, five, six in the morning and um these 21 and over clubs and then i moved to ohio i was like oh we don't we don't we don't sell alcohol on sundays there's nothing open that's there's nothing open that, that's past midnight i was like what universe am i living in right you now you know that happens in texas as well one yeah. of my best friends lives there lives there and he told me that i think it's friday saturdays and sundays past 7 p.m you cannot get alcohol anywhere that's not a bar anywhere like over here, we just go to Ralph's. Well, just, yeah, at all times. There, it is. Um, yes, absence of alcohol laws <laughs> over here. Um, so Rebecca, she's the bartender. She talks again, just laying the scene. Recognize O'Keefe as a regular. Um, he typically drank beer. Brian Albert, his wife, and Brian Higgins were also mentioned as being present. He talked. She talked about his her interaction with with John. Noted that. O'Keefe visited the bar that night to order a beer. She observed the presence of other individuals, including regular patrons and acquaintances. Um, she confirmed the presence of O'Keefe and others on the evening in question, highlighting a typical and enjoyable atmosphere at the bar. So there's nothing really just, there's nothing of note that would indicate that anything is afoot. The really, so far, the only thing that you really have that hasn't even really come into evidence yet is the, is the voicemail that was left by Karen. That's going to come eventually. Uh, but... Everybody's having a good time. Maybe there's relationship problems. There's been a lot of speculation in this case about, hey, Karen was cheating with one of the guys that was in the house. Um, John was uh, like this, uh, living this bachelor life because he was enjoying his life as a, whatever, a, a cop and just keeping his options open. Um, there was some indication that their relationship was on the rock so far as the testimony is coming out. That's not really bearing. Um, Why is there always allegations of cheating? Always, always. Well, they're motive right um she shared her personal associations knowledge of the albert family and their frequented presence at the bar along with insights and higgins and atf atf agents with ties to the canton uh, police department uh, kurt roberts had talked about his friendship with john uh, testified about his friendship with o'keefe uh, talked about interactions at the bar describing uh, the night of january 28th where O'Keefe and Karen Reed were present among friends. He observed conversations. Everyone's acting normal and friendly about when they left. Um, he talked about Robert's, he described his action response on the news, including his efforts to support his wife and assist in the search for O'Keefe. So when he found out, this is what his testimony was, he recounted the events of the following morning when his wife received calls and texts about John. That's when he realized that John was missing. And then he's trying to lend his support. Um, he portrayed Karen as a caring and involved, loving person, involved with children, particularly in coordinating activity, activities and events. And that was it. 
Um, Catherine came in to talk about, again, um, about how they were socializing, about how they were, uh, you know, they're all just basically kind of cor cor corroborating everything. There's not really anything of note that's going to raise any or score any points for the prosecution in this point. So I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. Julie Albert, let's talk about her. So Julie Albert gets up to testify. On the morning of January 29th of 22, she drove to her brother-in-law Albert's home after picking up donuts for her nephew. On the morning of January 29th, she found the family visibly upset and Jennifer McCabe, I can't wait for her to come and testify. Um, she's the one where there's like deleted text messages and all this other craziness going on. Um, but Jennifer McCabe had informed her that something had happened to John with uncertainty about his condition. Uh, she talks about interactions with Courtney Proctor. There were questions about uh, frequency and nature of her interactions, calls and conversation with Proctor on specific dates, um, police inquiries. There were state police troopers visiting Albert's home a few days after O'Keefe's death. Uh, she highlighted her ties to individuals involved in the case, including her sister-in-law, Nicole, and her husband, Brian, as well as state police investigator Michael Proctor and Canton police officers. On cross-examination, they dove into her relationship with those individuals and their potential impact on the case. Of course, they're still trying to paint the picture that there is collusion going on in this case, that uh, she's being framed. Julie's responses uh, to the events on January 29th, uh, they talked about that. Uh, they talked about her memory and details. Um, Albert gets on the stand to testify, talks about his relationship with John, says that O'Keefe was a neighbor who frequented Albert's pizza shop with his nephew. Um, he considered him a friend, had a friendly relationship. He talks about the events on January 28th. He said he texted O'Keefe about meeting up that night, but they ended up at different bars initially. They eventually met at the Waterfall Bar and Grill. No signs of tension. Okay. Uh, talked about the clear liquid. Um, talked about the end of the evening. They had fireball shots. Jesus. When's the last time you had a fireball shot? Are you talking to me or him? Either, either or. Never. It's been a while. I was like 18, maybe. Yeah. 18 or 19. You're talking about the little liquor that has like a yellow. Uh, yeah, no, never. My it's, brother used to use it. It's like literally it. like a cinnamon flavored. I don't know if it's whiskey. It's like it's like mystery alcohol. I don't know what challenge. it's supposed to be. There was a challenge on that, I remember, and my brother stupidly did it. What what did he do? I think he was I think he was eighteen. No, 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 scratch that. I I was already living here. I, so I was like twenty two, maybe he was like twenty, something along those lines, and he saw it online. Like you had to like chug the entire thing, something like that in like five seconds, six seconds, something like that. And then I come home and my house is entirely destroyed because the thing burned his entire throat and he was like drinking water, milk, everything, like everything. It was a disaster. That just sounds like not a lot of fun. Yes. <sighs> Let's get into some of this testimony with Julie. Um, Cross-examination. I thought that this was important. She, he asked him, do you deny that you're very close to Courtney Proctor? Albert said No. Um, Courtney Proctor's brother, Michael Proctor, he's the lead state investigator on this case. Already passed an hour. How how was how are we doing on time, Dominic? Uh, an hour twenty right now. We're on an hour twenty. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ! <laughs> how much more do I got to go? <laughs> um, it's a long trial, and they're still not even on half of it. All right. So. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, yesterday at trial, uh, Lieutenant Charles Ray gets to testify, and he said that he responded to the scene um, where an unresponsive man was found, learning that the O'Keefe was a Boston police officer. You see, the problem with these two-month-long trials is that they're so cumulative in the evidence. Um, I understand why it is, but the, the danger that you have as an attorney is that I often feel it sometimes with the judges. Like, you don't want the case to move on too long. I understand you got a lot of stuff you got to get to, but you got to hit your points. And the reason why you get it all on evidence is for appellate purposes, really. Um, but 
also. But the problem is you have this, this cumulative evidence. Everybody's kind of repeating the same thing. It corroborates some things. It cements the timeline for, uh, for the jury. Um, it just makes it drag on so much. But he testifies. Um, he learned about that O'Keefe was an officer. Um, he conducted a well check on O'Keefe's children, um, not inspecting the right rear passenger side of Karen Reed's vehicle at the scene. On cross, they focused on specific details related to evidence, handling, preservation, inspection at the scene, cross-examination. Um, they, they hit him with, they, they talked about potential oversights that he did. And again, it's hard to kind of paraphrase all that because they, they, I got like 10 minutes to wrap this up. Um, Adam Lawley, they talked about well, his, his is mostly just cumulative evidence, probing potential inconsistencies, testimony. Yeah, same stuff. Um, well, here's the bottom line. I'm going to wrap this up right now. Here's my takeaway from everything. Without boring everybody, just going through every single individual, this is much better served than like a daily recap. Um, hey, how did that? Ha what happened? Oh, does that you? <laughs> Said I got sick of Smirnoff in my early twenties, and now if I get the slightest whiff of it, I yeah. You know what that happened to me with um, Goldschlager. I don't even know if you guys know what that is. It's like some weird mystery alcohol that has gold remnants in it. It's really, it's probably not gold. It's probably like gold shavings or whatever. Um, really bad. It's similar to Fireball. Here, here's my take with this case. So far, I don't think that the prosecution is doing a very good job of letting the jury know that this is a case where... Karen Reed ran into her boyfriend, husband, left him for dead in the snow. We haven't even gotten to the voicemail yet, as far as I'm aware. Um, basically, if I'm scoring this on um, a fighting card, if I'm, if I'm going like the first three rounds, we're, we're, we're basically in round three at this point. The defense is winning all of these rounds. And there's not really much happening. We, we know about the state. As far as the evidence has come out, you know they went to a bar. Um, from what all of the witnesses have said, they had a good relationship. It was a loving relationship. They were being affectionate with each other. Nobody was really upset at each other. At some point, um, Karen becomes enraged. She gets really upset. She leaves. And um, according to the prosecution, she's supposed to have ran over him with the car. Um, but what has actually come out, if I'm a juror and I'm sitting on this case, the things that are sticking out into my mind is this, um, they found him. Karen was distraught. She was probably intoxicated. Um, she was trying to, to, uh, to help him. She was trying to perform CPR. She was doing chest compressions and all of those things. And that the investigation about how the crime scene was investigated was like amateur hour. That's what I'm getting from this trial so far through the first couple of weeks of evidence. If you ask me to provide uh, who's winning and who's losing, well, right now the prosecution is not really impressing in terms of them trying to prove them that their, their case. And it's a long trial. I understand. It's a really long trial. I get it. Um, I just, my biggest criticism right now of the prosecution is their lack of understanding of how to present this case to a juror, a jury that's impactful, that's going to lend itself to, oh, Karen did this. Um, and now she's trying to cover it up because oh, she's trying to help him out. Um, but she was only doing that because of the guilt that she felt. They're trying to do that, but it's just not landing from what I can tell. And again, it's a long trial. There's a long way to go. But in terms of trying to prove their case and trying to, to carry their burden they're not doing what I had wanted them to do um, when I first started covering this case a couple of weeks ago. They had to get over this idea, and of course, and it was very loud in the opening statements from the defense team, that they have to overcome this idea that, yes, there are connections between O'Keefe from the people that investigated this case, from the people that were in the house. They're all entangled somewhere. That has nothing to do with a conspiracy. What they're supposed to show is that has 
everything to do with it's just circumstantial they happen to be law enforcement they are law enforcement law enforcement that works even in different departments in a city like boston they're going to know each other um and what the defense has done they haven't done a good job so far and again they're not presenting their cases so it's not like they're they're supposed to do this but on cross-examination at the very least what they've been able to do is obliterate the uh obliterate the methods of collection of evidence which compromises the entire investigation on its face. And if you didn't have anything having to do with framing, if there's no allegation of uh, uh, inter-city or inter-department collusion of, of a conspiracy to frame Karen Reed and all you had was the collection of evidence, you have the foundation already for reasonable doubts. And we're in the prosecution's case in chief. And so it was problematic for them I don't know where they're going from here. I mean, I actually do know where they're going. They're going to have to, at some point, um, get to the fireworks where we were talking about the uh, the voicemail. We have to get to the autopsy. They have to present evidence of the autopsy. I don't know if that came out today. I know they're in trial right now. Maybe I'll do a recap a little bit later about that. Um, but for right now, it's not looking good. Everybody, all of the, all of the layperson commentary that I've seen, focuses on the idea that the the defense team is doing an outstanding job. And here's what what I think is playing into that. I think that the judge is not likable. I think if you if you watch the judge in this case and you're just observing, I don't think that you look at her and you like her very much. And we've seen judges like that where um in the Murdoch case, everybody loved that judge. In the um the Daryl Brooks case, um I forget that lady's name, but she was put that was the sovereign citizen guy. That's what him? I was gonna ask you. Everybody loved her. Loved her, but this <laughs> judge just seems like an ornery. She's she's grumpy. She's always yelling at the defense team. It seems like she's having these uh, interactions. She's on camera. She's not presenting. Well, she doesn't have to present anything. Um, but the people that are watching this trial, they're getting that impression and they're being swayed. I think that the the judge is being unfair to the defense and the defense is being so respectful and they're presenting really well during their motions and their pretrial motions and all of those things and they're if if that's what's happening right now with the general public the jury's sitting there or observing the same things and that's i don't right. know where they're at i just know that right now if i was the prosecution i would be really nervous it's just not going well for them at all it's supposed to be the nature of trial that your case in chief as the prosecution is um, when you're the defense attorney, it's supposed to feel bad. I always tell my clients that, look, they get to go first. Mm -hmm. They're going to put on their case. I just want you to know it's going to feel bad. You're going to be, th you're going to think that we're losing. It's one of the first things you always tell them. You just have to wait because we get a chance to rebut. I get a chance to do cross-examination. We're going to put on our own case, all of those things. So just relax, just relax. In this case, I don't have any indication that Karen so far um, is all that upset and anything that's come out? What are they? What have they got so far? Um, my impressions are okay. She was out having a good time. She was drinking. She, there was no motive to kill John so far, from what I've seen in testimony. That's it. That's everything they have. When she found out that he was missing, she didn't remember what happened. She may or may not have made some statements about, "Oh, I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. I killed him," or something like that. Paramedics just made those statements, um, but even that is questionable, and the defense even raise questions into whether or not she even said that. Um, but she was definitely trying to help. Um, it's just not the image that I would be nervous about if I was Karen. I think that right now she's probably fine. I think that when she goes back at the end of these trial days, um, she's over there high-fiving her defense teams. Oh, that came out really well. Um, if you've ever experienced a trial... I could not imagine. I've never, I, I don't know what the longest trial I've ever been on. I think it was three weeks. It was a civil case out in LA. This is long before. You were probably not even, a, you're still in diapers. You were not. Um, that would have been back in 2017 or something. But it was um, the level of endurance you have to have as a trial attorney is just off the walls. Imagine. You've seen me in trial. I'm sitting there. I got my client sitting right there to my left. Um, and as I'm trying to listen to the testimony, as I'm trying to um, listen for objections, um, listen for 
things that I need to bring up on my cross-examination, uh, link their statements to what is in the known discovery. I'm doing all of these, all this processing. And then I got um, my client in my ear. Hey, don't forget to tell them. Oh my God. It's like, I cannot listen to you and them and the judge and count. Listen. And you may say it's not common. It is pretty common. I give them a, well, what I've learned is I give them a, a pad of paper and I have them write, just write it. I cannot have you yelling in my ear. It's, it's just not, just write it down for me. I promise you, I'll read it. And then 95% of the time, it's like, nah, don't worry about that. Or sometimes I'll take it and I'm like, oh, yeah, well, did you we know that on such here. and such a day? We practice it practice it here at well. If I have, for example, for family law cases, if I have to prep them for mediation, which happens a lot, uh, they start asking me questions. I'm like, no, put it down in a piece of paper, write it down, type it down on your phone, whatever. And they do it. And it's easier that way. That's all I have to say about the um, Karen Reed trial for a recap of days uh, one through nine. Um, we are going to be moving on to segment Family Law After Dark in a, in a couple minutes here. And we are back. So on uh, this edition of Family Law After Dark... Um, I'm not even sure where to start. Let me just check something real quick on the Tilted Lawyer. All right. All right. So, Melissa, last time you were on Family Law After Dark, it was a couple of weeks ago. Everybody really liked it. That's really why you're here today, to participate in, the, in, in this segment. And um, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, but here is our first case. So, um, this lady is 54, has been living separately from her husband for about five years. He works in a different state. He visits during the weekends every few months and provides living expenses regularly. Mm -hmm. Since the beginning of her marriage, uh, she was subjected to physical, mental, verbal abuse by the hands of her husband, which stopped a decade ago, only after she threatened to go to the cops, uh, but she never did. Uh, she wants to file for divorce because she wishes to cut all ties with him and family. All right. Um, a local advocate painted a very grim picture of divorce, um, and the family wants to understand what's the best approach to move forward with the divorce proceedings. And at this point, at this point, she doesn't have any evidence regarding any affair, but there is a possibility to prove abuse that is over 10 years old. Um, the husband doesn't want a mutual, uh, uh, they don't want a, he won't agree to a mutual divorce. Um, I don't know what state this person is in, mm -hmm. so I don't know if it's a community property state or not. I don't know if it's a no-fault state or not. Um, and so there's a, there's very scant evidence that I'm going off of. But if it is a no fault state, then she doesn't really need his permission. Um, she doesn't have to like prove that she's been abused or anything like that. She could just sign up for a divorce if that's what she wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, if you're trying to prove domestic violence that occurred even over five years ago, um, you're not going to get anywhere with that. Uh, it's too old. And then she lived with the guy 10 years afterwards. So they're going to question that going to raise the question i think that the issue is she mentions that they're of indian descent i think the bigger question is how it's going to Wait. affect the family Scratch middle that. eastern okay yeah that's what i was gonna i wanted you to um, yeah. give me a little bit more and, and and so you know there's other dynamics that have nothing to do with law uh, that she's concerned about um and so this is probably not the the best case for us to analyze. Um, but in terms of the legal aspects of it, if she wants to get a divorce, get a divorce. Um, all she has to put, even, if, even in a state that wasn't an, an, an alt, that was not an at fault state, all she would have to do um, is find, um, well, number one, talk to whatever state you're in an attorney over there. Um, but if she can find, and that, you know what, I don't want to talk about those kinds of states I'm just saying that if she wants a divorce, then file for one. The first mm -hmm. step to, to getting a divorce is filing, filing for a divorce. She doesn't know um, 
if that's her big concern, he's not going to agree to it. In most states, um, it doesn't matter who agrees to anything. Divorce is not a mutual thing. It's usually somebody wants it, and then you know the other person has no choice, especially at, an, at, at a no-fault state. Um, to the extent that that's where she is, then she should just file. This reminds me of something that you're not going to like when I mention it, but anyway, I'm going to do it because I love to see a reaction. It reminds me of Kim Ye's divorce when... Kim asked the judge to declare her as a single individual because their divorce had been going on for almost two years and she wanted to be declared a single individual. No. And this guy submitted a 42-page declaration as to why she should not be deemed as a single person and the judge just granted it. Of course, because it's irrelevant. His 42 pages of bullshit doesn't matter. Um, it's called a bifurcated um judgment which is what she asked for mm -hmm. anyway there's not a whole lot of beef on that on, on that scenario so i'm moving on on that case um let's move on to a different one so this person wants to know um if they are the asshole <laughs> i love those kind of scenarios go on for giving advice to his friend that resulted in him divorcing his wife i mean i'm who am i to judge i don't uh... know elaborate on it. I don't even that know where we're good. going with this, but let's, let's go for it. All right. So last October, um, a guy showed up at my friend's house claiming that he was the father of friend's eight year old. I feel like this is an old one. Go on. Somebody showed up at his store saying he's just the father of the eight year old, what son, daughter. Uh, give me one second. Well, this is what's going on. Okay, so mm -hmm. someone showed up at my friend's house claiming he was the father of friend's eight-year-old and that he got friend's wife pregnant in an affair but ran off and broke contact. Hell broke loose on the guy first seeing how the wife was acting suspicious. He confronted her where she admitted to the cheating but claimed the child was my friend's. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we've done this one no. or not, but it feels like... I've, I've had a case like this before. Um, friend got a paternity test done, found out he's not the father. He was hurt and depressed. He left his house and stayed at a room away to think about the situation. His wife reached out to all our common friends and asked, they all asked him to forgive the wife and move on. Friend was feeling complicated. His thoughts kept revolving around the eight-year-old. The divorce law on my area says that infidelity is grounds for divorce, but it is the father's responsibility to make sure his kids are secure financially. I don't know what state these people are in. Um, but if the father can prove that the wife committed paternity fraud, he gets out easy. Um, any lawyer can take and win this case. Uh, and I don't think there's really anything to win here, buddy. Uh, but uh, due to his conflicting feelings, he had a massive breakdown. The wife and child also showed up to his place and caused a scene, asking for forgiveness and for daddy to come back. Gosh, that sucks. That's kind of heartbreaking. Yes, it Kid is. Kid is eight? Eight. eight. <sighs> it's not that young, but also not that old. I usually stayed and listened to what he was feeling and saying, not giving any input, try to avoid answering or adding my answer in any way and said there was no right answers. What could I do? Um, he kept on pressing me for a more direct answer, seeing how desperate he was for an answer. I told him that I would leave my wife in such a... Okay, are you the asshole for saying, offering solicited uh, advice? No. Um, but who gives a shit about that? I mean, just legally. Um, look, the guy could get a divorce if he wants to. Um, I guess my immediate attention is to, from the perspective of the eight-year-old, who has a dad that she thought... It's a she? I think that she said that the it was a daughter. Did I miss that? Oh, my God. Well, daughter or son, doesn't matter. Um, you have a kid that's eight years old that was growing up being raised by what she or he thought was their father. And turns out mom cheated. Paternity test confirms. And, uh, well, now he is not the father. What do you even do? What recourse do you have? I don't know. What would you do? Okay. I mean, it's, it's hard to ask you from a, hey, Dominic. <laughs> exactly. 
What do you do in a case where you are raising an eight-year-old that you think is yours and you come to find out eight years later that it, well, it's not. It's uh, the milkman's. I want stuff, dude. Honestly, like, after eight years, kind of like yours because mm-hmm. you raise it from, uh, you know, birth. So, I don't know. Honestly, it's, it's pretty hard. Oh, it's so weird. I just had, like, a dream about this last <laughs> night. The universe is a strange place. I don't know. If you invest eight years in a child, it's difficult to say, oh, well, you ain't mine. So lots of luck to you, buddy. But then, then again, there's fathers out there that, you know, 100% confidence in the biological strength of that bond is an, ah, well, lots of luck to you anyway. Uh, I, I don't give a shit about the father or the mom in this case. My heart breaks for the child. Mm -hmm. And I have this to say. I mean, I I have some very vile things to say to women with respect to this scenario. I don't feel like there's any scenario where a female would not be 100% confident that the child is their partner's I just don't think that there's any scenario like if you know that there's some hanky panky going on, there's some bullshit going on, you're running around on your old man and there's even a modicum of a chance that the child does not belong to your boyfriends or your husbands and you go through with the marriage and you don't take appropriate mer- uh, steps to, to make sure that we figure out what the family structure is going to be, there is a special ring of hell devoted strictly to you. What do, you, what do you think about that, Melissa? You're 100% true. This is all on the mom. I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to sound like a BITCH at this point and they're all going to hate me and uh, paint me as a pygmy girl and whatever the hell you want to call it because that's pygmy? like Pygmy? Pygmy? Yeah, that's a new that's like a new that's like a new you, you know what I'm talking about, right? That's like yeah. a new label that they're using now. Pygmy. A, a pygmy girl. Oh, PIC. Yeah, P I C K. Okay. Pick me, girl. Pick me. Okay. Yeah. But this falls 100% on the mom. I am so freaking sorry, but it does. Uh, what Omar said, he made a very valid point. If you are messing around with somebody else and you are not 100% sure that the father of your child is the father of your child, then you are a piece of crap if you keep going on with the marriage and make somebody believe that that's his or her. That's his son. Hey, look, I'm all daughter. for women's rights and women's liberation and all of that. And no, sure, me too, right 100% to choose, but, sure. Hey, you got a responsibility to, at the very least, make sure that everybody's on the up and up with who belongs to who. Even if that means, look, I would not be mad at this lady if she in secret tried to get a DNA test to confirm certain things. Me neither. She's on her right to do it. And she wants to make things right. So that you don't run into a situation like I was reading about this judge who's like now in his 70s or 80s. He's going to, um, their, his family is going through these DNA tests, blood tests, to figure out if they are compatible to donate a kidney to his ailing wife. Mm-hmm. And in the midst of that, his 40-year-old son takes a test and finds out that, hey, you're not the, you are not the father of this 40-year-old. 40 years of your life gone and then the judge make like i don't know if you, you you probably have seen the tiktok the judge is like i just thought the guy was an idiot i mean i had no idea now it makes perfect sense i just thought he was you know whatever i was at my wits end we just got supporting um, this guy for 40 years and somebody called last week actually um talking about they wanted to they wanted to petition their son and they were an american citizen and I asked him because he wanted his wife, who was the step stepmom of the child, to do it. And I was like, do you have a citizenship? He's like, yeah, I've been an American citizen for 40 years. I was like, then why don't you do it? He's like, oh, my son is 19. I was like, okay. So um, about two months ago, um, I had to, I needed blood and he was not compatible. And then when we ran the tests, we figured out that he was not my biological son. And then when I confronted his mom, who's back in our country, she had to let the truth know that uh, at the same time that she was with me, she was 
dicking around with somebody else. She doesn't know where the hell that person is, and boom. And she just thought that this was his son, and that's it. He found out that way. <sighs> I don't know, man. I honestly don't give a shit about this case. I just, I, I can't get over the fact that this kid is now. Imagine, you're like, you're eight years old, you got dad, and all. I mean, honestly, and all of a sudden. probably the kid is going to be fine. Probably. Lots of kids go through that. They're married. You know, they're, they're proxy divorce or whatever. And all of a sudden, mom wants to take the child away from dad and move far away. And, like, you know, we've seen cases like that where mom just, there's no reason for it. She's fallen out of love with this guy. She doesn't want him to be a part of him. She met somebody new. She wants him to be the dad now. So she does everything she can to pr- create a barrier between father and child because she wants to dictate this new life and cut dad completely out. We've seen cases like that where women do those kinds of things. And... You know, oftentimes in, in these cases, I'm very much the advice that we give on this show. Most of the people that have, what's the demographics of the people listening to the show? It's like 80 to 20 in favor of women mm-hmm. for whatever reason. But of all of the cases, most of them are from the female perspective. But I'm just looking at this case and putting in this in this scenario where a mother is action is actively trying to sabotage a child's childhood and replace father unilaterally. Just because it fits her narrative best. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and all the while, this this child um, is probably being told, oh, um, I wish you could see your dad, but he has, you know, he doesn't have any time for you. He's busy. He's somewhere else. Blah, 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 yeah, blah, blah. if he really cared about us, he'd be here. I guess he's got something better to do. And then they start poisoning the child's they mind with this kind of stuff. They children's heads. Um, and all the while, you have dad over here fighting tooth and nail just to get a path to his children. I remember... I remember very vividly we had a case like that. I think we're thinking about the same case. Yes, we are. Uh, It was horrible because it took me three hours to put together a binder of a lot of exhibits. Yes, I was crying the entire time. Uh, God was just a blue collar, hardworking guy just trying to find a way to get back to the children. We had a whole binder of stuff about all the good stuff because she's trying to tell the judge that. Daughter doesn't want to go with him. She thinks all because this because their that, relationship whatever. never existed. Something like that. He's like he's an absent father, and then so what do you mean it never existed? Look at all of these pictures Binder. for the last four years. Photoshop. Yeah. I was like, the energy that that man had to put in just to even prove the fact. No, I'm not an absentee father. I've been trying to get to her for six months. She literally just moved to a, a different county, miles away, um, and is not giving me access to her. And making up stuff, and we had to litigate. Just the energy that it took to litigate that, the expense it took to litigate that. It's um, I don't know, man. What do you do with people like that? There are women like that that are out there. They're yes, literally they are. evil, and, they're, and their fathers like that as well. But unfortunately, sure. I'm going to have to say this. Based on my experience, the vast majority of cases I've seen in this are women. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, but it's true. Uh, no, I'll I'll say it. It's like ninety five percent of the time when that is the scenario, it's it's from a woman's it's perspective. It's from a woman. Mm-hmm. For whatever for whatever reason, women believe that they get to be the gatekeepers to access to the children, and they they behave accordingly. Oh my God, let's just move on. I just remember that. Let's let's move on to another, another one before I get canceled. Oh, that's another thing we can get canceled. Forgot about that. All right. So this person is 44 kids. I'm miserable being married. Uh, guys who've been there and pulled the trigger. Um, well, what advice do you have for me? Says, this is a familiar situation, I'm sure. Were it not for the kids, I'd have left years ago. Oh, you're such a saint. You're such a trooper, aren't you? I think this guy deserves a gold star. Let's wait, give him wait, a medal. Wait. What did he say? 44? He wants to be given he credit miserable? about how he's stayed in this miserable marriage for the sake of the children. Ah, no, I don't know. Maybe it's the whiskey talking, but I just, you know, I think this guy's full of shit already. I'm one sentence in. Um, were it not for the kids I'd have left years ago, she gives me no affection, constantly nags, spends way too much money, and yells at me over the stupidest shit. I get zero time for myself or freedom to pursue hobbies. There's absolutely no reason for me to stay in the marriage except for the kids who are under 10. Hmm. What should he do? 
Duermen juntos, pero no se tocan también. You're going to have to translate, not everybody. I know. I said it in Spanish because I think a lot of people are not going to understand, but that's it. I'm hey. just saying like, oh, we're together for the kids, blah, 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 blah. I've heard that story many times before. Hey, Dominic, what do you what do you say to this guy? Dive in and stuff at him. He is 44. He says he's miserable in his marriage. He has how many kids? He's Two? like a martyr. He says, oh, I'm sacrificing myself. Yeah, like, oh, my, my God. Feel so sorry for me because I've stayed in this miserable marriage for so long because of my children and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, well, here's a, here, no, here, here's a stereotype. A lot of men. Um, I've heard that phrase many times. A lot of men feel like, and they give TikTok. It's such like a, a, a toxic place. It is. I see all these TikToks about guys saying, oh, nobody cares about us or our feelings. And we just have to, you know, we go through all of this stuff and we work hard and nobody cares about if we're having a bad day and, and whatnot. And TikTok is the worst place where you can go for advice or like for comfort. This guy wants plotting. to feel sorry for himself. He's like, look, I don't know what she would say to all of that. I just had a case last week. You weren't here for this one. I think you were in Vegas. For your birthday um on friday yeah eliana was on me and then it was like this there was this okay i want you to reframe what you what i just read to you right here about this guy hey she gives me no affection she constantly nags and spends way too much money and yells at me over stupid shit i get zero time or freedom for myself or pursue hobbies and there's no reason for me to stay except for the kids but this other lady was like my husband literally doesn't bathe for weeks he sits there and plays video games all the time. Um, he's completely narcissistic. He gets mad at me for caring for my children. He gets mad because I spend, it, because I give them attention, and he he says stuff about it. And then we're thinking he doesn't bathe for two weeks. So imagine that that was there, and then this is the guy on the other end. She gives me no affection. That's what I was gonna say that's the other perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have her perspective, and I don't know if that's the case. He might bathe there every day for for all I know. Look, if you're 44. And you're a man, you're married, you got kids that are under 10. Here's the situation. You can get divorced if you want to. And you will pay child support and you will pay alimony and you will have to co-parent with a person that shows you no affection, uh, that nags you over the stupidest shit and all of those things. And you will have to find a way to make peace uh, with yourself and fine. But you're also 44. And I don't know, but I'm 43. You don't look the same as when you were 25. Um, you're older now. So what What do you want to do? You want to get divorced and you want to go and like peruse the internet for some 20-something-year-olds or whatever uh, because you're looking for affection in all the places that you're not getting it at home. I'm sure there's an aspect of you that is like craving the attention from women that you're not getting for whatever reason. There could be a million different reasons. It could be that his hygiene sucks. It could be just that they've been together for like 20, 25 years and the perils of having to raise children have sapped the sex drives from both of them all together. It could be that he's completely stopped trying. Look, I'm also oh, trying that's to... that's what he meant when he says no affection. Okay. My mind just clicked on that. I didn't pay attention. <laughs> I did not pay attention to that. I was paying attention to all the other demographics. Forgot that's very important for men. Yeah. Look, it sucks for her. I mean, it sucks for him. It, su it probably sucks, sucks for, for her, her too. too. Um, you have a decision to make, buddy. Uh, you very well can go ahead and get a divorce and deal with all of the things that come with it. Um, or, or you can, you know, die on your shield trying to save the marriage on the off chance that it might not just be a communication issue. It might not be, or it might be. Maybe. Okay. Look, if there's, if it's not domestic violence, if it's not like, uh, Substance abuse, Somebody is, like is not safe for whatever reason. Um, you know, there's a lot of psychologists out there that will go and say, hey, do you think that you're a better person with or without her? If you're having this feel sorry for yourself attitude, you're going to always say, oh, I'm definitely a better person without her because I feel happier and all of these things. Look, all of that's all well and good. You want to go find yourself? Go find yourself. Matter of fact, you want to take a temporary separation and you just go spend a month up the hill and, and meditate on life and do things and and bang a bunch of 20 something year olds or whatever 30 year olds or that if they're going to give you that kind of attention go for it buddy but in 10 years you're going to wake up and you're going to be 54 years old and you're not it, it, it's not all downhill from here 
you have a lifetime of, uh, well, you don't have a lifetime to pursue whatever, the one perfect person that you're looking for. I guess that's the question. Are you looking for like a happily ever after or do you just want to be a single person? You got to be honest with yourself. I don't think this guy, man, whatever, knows exactly what he wants. It. I mean, I get no. that feeling. From he hasn't I'm... given any indication that he's shooting in a direction. He just says that. That he feels miserable, that's it. He's just clouding. And he's feeling sorry for himself. Look, if he was, um, if he was sitting here in this office... I would just tell him if you really think you look, if you want to, I just, I just had this conversation. I feel like if you want to get a divorce, you can always get a divorce. If she hasn't filed for a divorce, you don't have to. Um, but you got to talk to her. You have to have some communication. I'm not going to be able to help you. You guys got to talk and figure this out. And if it's, if it's savable and you want to pull out all the stops to try to salvage something, then go for it. Because divorce is always going to be an option, but you're never, there's a, there's a, there's a threshold for married couples that if they go beyond it, there is no salvaging anything. I don't know if at this, if this couple is at that point, but to the, on the off chance that they are not at that point, it's worth it to pursue it because how long they've been married? He doesn't really say, does he? No, he doesn't say it. Let's just assume they've been married for over 10 well, years. Well, he's saying that he has two kids under 10. Yeah, so let's just say so, 15, 10, 20 years, whatever. Mm -hmm. They got married at 25. It's a 20-year relationship. You're never, ever, ever going to find another person, you know, at 44, maybe you will, that you're going to spend. Well, I guess I can't really say that's true. There's plenty of people that have met and found people and married in their, in their 40s. 40s and, you know, lived the rest of their life with that person. It's possible. I guess the cost is, is it's a lot, man. You're giving up access to your children. And I understand what he means. Oh, I'm staying for the children. Because really when, when men say that, it's not that they're, they're, they're trying to protect the children from whatever, some co-parenting relationship. What they're, what, they're, what they're guarding against is the lack of access to their children because of a, a married couple that has reached this level where they're just kind of roommates and uh, no affection and constantly nagging and bickering. Um, and, you know, they're probably having sex maybe once or twice a year, maybe less. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to resurrect feelings for that person when you've get, gotten to that point. But let's just assume that's not the case. All I'm saying is anybody could pick, anybody could hit the eject button at any time. If he's really concerned about the children and trying to salvage something, then he has to take it upon him and not, you know, come to people like myself to try to say, hey, should I get a divorce or not? The fact that he's even asking that question is cowardly. Because if you think it's time to get a divorce then just F and do it. Exactly. You don't need my permission to get a divorce. Of course. You can just I, look, do it by yourself. Yeah. The fact that he's asking the question, I have to believe there's a, some measure of this person that wants to salvage it. And look, go for it, man. Try to salvage it. Go uh, get yourself into counseling. I go mean, and take a vacation. Here's what I would nobody do. Nobody knows his spouse better than he does. Mm. She's got three people in her phone that knows her better than him he d he doesn't say that no but i know that as a family law attorney i know that and so i'm speculating it's not fair of me to say that of her i'm just assuming that if it's she just making a joke. now look here it's not a joke if there if if she's at the point where she's not giving him affection everything he does irritates her every little thing that he says and does Irritates her. She's oh my, constantly that's nagging. Part of marriage, isn't no. it? No. I mean, not all the time, but you get what I'm saying. Your spouse is going to get to part, your nerves. It's a part of a bad marriage. Your spouse is going to get to your nerves. That's normal. Yeah, but it does. But usually, there's still all the other good stuff in between. Yes. If it's nothing. But here's the but thing. The bad. He's only pointing out the bad things. Maybe there's some good parts that he's leaving out. Let's well, that's just, why. Let's just say it that way. Let's just call it that way. That's why I'm not telling him right away. Just hey, yeah, definitely go get a divorce for sure. He needs to man up and try to salvage it. 
if he wants to be the big hero, then he needs to go be the big hero. If I were him and he wanted to, if, here's what I would do. If he really wants to fire off the one last salvo, go schedule a four week vacation in Italy or something. One week, something, you know? Well, he's not saying where he's at, so let's just say it that way. Yeah, some, go someplace. Go someplace very with far With just away. you yourself and your wife. Mm hmm with no distractions, no kids, no nothing. And talk shit out. Get to know your 44-year-old wife because you don't know her anymore. Definitely you don't. And she sure as hell doesn't know you. And I guarantee you, um she might suspect, but she doesn't know that you feel this way. Dominic, do you remember the trend of Nate and Cassie? No. Where she's like walking and then he walks oh, like, yeah. you remember yeah. that? Yeah. This remember is that. the exact same thing. Yep. Lulu says that she's given affection to someone. Uh, probably. Uh, Jules says he don't got to say it, but. To be fair, I was thinking it also. Yeah. I don't know. But I would, look, take her on a one-week, two-week vacation. Get to know your wife again, man. Fall in love again, if it's possible. And if, if, if it doesn't work out when it's just you two in a exotic place, not even exotic, just a different place. A, a Secluded place. A space that is different than, you know, the, the status quo. Um, then yeah, maybe it's time to call a quest, but give it one more shot. See what happens. That's all I got to say to this guy before I get too uh, rough with them. But all right, let's move on to another one. This guy says, all right. I would have been much more sweeter. What would you have said? No, no, you already said everything. All right. This is a guy <laughs> asking a question. If it was a woman, it would, have, it would have been different. I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm harsher on men. Or women, I don't. I, I feel like I, I don't really pick and choose. I just try to tell it like it is. If he was my brother, that's exactly what I would tell him. Um, anyway, so I've been seeing this amazing guy for a couple of months. Ah. He is a vetted good guy. Started bad. Vetted by who? Exactly. By her friends, I'm sure. He unfortunately is going through a divorce right now. <laughs> <laughs> Things have been going amazing between us, including planning that we are going to do once everything it. is officially done. Then a few days ha after a disagreement over something silly, he asked me to give him space to figure things out. Sweetie. Regarding his divorce, he originally asked for a couple of days, which turned to almost two weeks of no talking. I reached out once and he was very distant. This has been tough because I miss him a lot. I, I got him a gift because he asked for space to cheer him up and show support. And I let him know about it when he asked for space. I would like to ask to meet this Friday to talk. I also think to ask if his feelings for me have changed. Would that be wise to do? Hmm. Sweetie, I'm just going to say it. Sweetie, you're dating a married man. Do I have to say anything else? I'm yeah. just going to leave it as it is. Well, let's just give the guy the benefit of the no, doubt. No, I'm not giving anybody the freaking benefit of the doubt, Omar. My God. From a, from, <laughs> no, I'm, as soon as she said, I'm dating this amazing, I was like, no, this is bad. This is really bad. Well, let's just assume they're in like a divorce that's been going on for a couple of years and they're, he's living at his own place and they got like custody and visitation orders. So, and the stuff has been filed. Let's just assume that and that's the case. And then she said something and he disappeared for two weeks and he's not answering. Oh, she's trying. He's trying to ghost her. Shook her. Yeah. So that that's how serious it was going with his divorce that they had so much plans. And then all of a sudden she says something that he's not agreeable with. And then, boom, he disappears two weeks. <gasps> Gasp in Spanish. After, <laughs> after a disagreement over something silly. Yeah. Men don't escalate things like that. If a man escalates anything with a woman, it's a it's a big red flag. I don't want to speak for all. Hey, Dominic, how often do you escalate things? Not often. <laughs> I think the only time my husband, husband slash fiance has escalated something with me is when I said something that really, really hurt him, like touched his senses. Mm. That was the one and only time. And it was like three years ago. I guess you gotta say there's no, there's never been a time with my wife where I'm like, we're going to sit down and discuss this right now. 
We need to talk about our relationship. That would never come from me. Men don't escalate things like that. We don't want to have those conversations. It's not because we don't think they're important. It's just that we just have a different way of communicating. I've but when things. usually when a man escalates something that's like you said, your husband was very hurt by something you said. This guy or this lady says that he it was something silly and he escalated it because well, he's looking for a way out. He's he's had his fill of you. Um, he had his fun with you and now he's done. And he'd really appreciate it if you leave him alone because he's got like four other women on his roster that he needs to uh, explore because he's just getting out of a divorce and he's trying to go and discover America. So leave him to his devices. Do not be disillusioned thinking that there's any kind of a future between you and him because um, very likely there isn't. If you want to get trapped into that, he's just not having it. You're going to get ghosted pretty soon. Piece of advice. Please don't date a man that says that he's getting divorced, but it's taking so long. Please don't do it. Well, I'll tell you what. If the guy's telling you that he needs space, it's space to do other women. That's what it is. I'm just calling it what it is. That's what it is. I have to side on you on that. Well, that's what that's that's the only reason he would need space. Exactly. Just, look, hey, just leave me alone already. You know what? You know what? Do you want some Uber money? That's where he's going with it. He's not interested. Um, plus, he's just getting out of a relationship. Why would you want to get into? Why would you assume that any guy that's going through a divorce just wants to get? Oh yeah, I'm definitely just going to get remarried right now. Stresses are overstepping. Give him years to recover and get over it, and you know maybe in four or five years. Um, maybe then he'll be ready to go into a serious relationship. But right now, it looks like he's trying to sow his royal oats, royal, royal oats, to quote, coming to America. You guys probably don't even know what that movie is, huh? This sounds like a 20-year-old something dating a 40-year-old something. That's the perception I'm getting. No, because when I was a divorcee, when I was like a 29th, well, I was in law school, um, the women that I were dating were not 20 something year olds. They were my age or like in their thirties. I dated some women in their forties. I dated some in their twenties, but they all, they were all very similar in that they wanted to like, uh, settle down, go to relationship level. And I'm like, <laughs> shit, I just got, like, I just, <laughs> I just got out of a relationship. I, I'm just got divorced. Parentheses. I just want you to know that that's the exact same reaction I get when I show him like, like a situation where it's so dramatic. He's like, "She, not now." <laughs> just let the guy go, man. You, you you be best moving on. Yes. Do not invest anything into this guy. He's probably gonna ghost you soon, so you should act accordingly. He Look. already ghosted her. Um. Well. I don't he basically know if he did. did. He basically did. He tried to, just in a nice way. But whatever. That's all I got to say to uh, to, to this person. Uh, let's move on. Okay. So this person was asking me um, if you're on the other side of divorce. What does that mean? If you've been divorced before and you're happy and stable, what advice would you give newbies? Oh, that's an Omar answer. Not a me answer, because I haven't been married. Why's it got to be an Omar answer? I'm not married, Omar. You're about to be? Yes, but I haven't been divorced. You have. You have you're on the other side of the spectrum. What a dick. <laughs> ¿Qué quieres que te diga? It's the truth. Mm -hmm. All right. So this person <laughs> Ose I'm I'm not offended. I'm just I know, I'm kidding. With you. Um so there's no definitive timeline. I'm just curious what those of you on here have been post divorce for several years. And if you found a new satisfying relationship, managed to co parent what is oh the co parent. You see, it is a no more answer. All right. What is the best advice you can give to those of us who are still grappling with this? All right, so the co-parenting thing, if you got a kid, that sucks. You have to fight for your kids. You have to. If you don't have a reasonable co-parent uh, to work with and they're trying to gatekeep you from your child, you can't let that stand. you got to fight tooth and nail for your child if it's important to you. And if it's not, then don't worry about it. Uh, that will bear itself out by the merits of your actions. And that's all I really have to say on that issue. But the best co-parenting plans are those where you speak the least amount possible to your ex, to your co-parent. There's no reason, look, there's no reason to have your ex in your life at all, whatsoever. If Please you're pay attention to what he just said. You don't Great need advice. to keep up with what's going on in their life. 
you don't have to know their financial situation. You got to know their living situation. You definitely don't need to know who they're dating. Who gives a shit? You ain't going to be telling them all the people that you're dating. It's just not important. So cancel that part of it out. Matter of fact, it should get to the point where you speak only about your child in one or two word sentences. Well, that's the logical thing to do. Well, it? it's the ideal thing to do. Um, if you could accomplish that and maintain as much contact with your child as possible, then great. You're way ahead of the game. So let's talk about the dating aspect of it. You have to, depending on your age, I'm just going to assume he's like probably in his 30s or so. You have to learn how to date without purpose. The mistake that so many young people make. Dominic, you should listen up. <laughs> Melissa, you're already expired. You're already betrothed. Haven't I been expired for like three years? No, you just turned 30. I thought the cutout age was 27. Oh, no. It's half the age of the man plus seven. Of who man? According to uh, the Nation of Islam. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was just going to ask, according to American Pie or what? <laughs> no. Um, I joke my, my, with my wife that um, when I met her, she was 29. And uh, she was like uh, about to expire. A couple of months from her thirtieth birthday, it's like, oh, you're about to expire, huh? That well, it's still good past the expiration date, I guess. <laughs> just messing. This just reminded me of the take the number and multiply it by three. Take the number and divide it by three. Mm. And what's the result? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. What are you talking In about? An American Pie two. Um, thank God, I don't remember the names of these people. But anyway, they came back from college and Kevin and Vicky, they used to date in high school, but they broke up because they went to different colleges. Oh, yeah, I remember them. Exactly. And <laughs> when they spoke about, I don't know why the conversation came over, but somebody asked somebody how many people they had slept with. And then Vicky said three. And mm. then he said three as well. And then when they went to their like mutual oh, friends yeah. group, they were like, she said three. No, you take that number and then you multiply it by three. That's the actual. That's the actual number. No, I, I really believe that. And to be then true. when she went to her friends, it's like, no, you take that number and then you divide it by three. That's the actual <laughs> answer. Yeah, men overstate, women understate. It's a thing. So that equation. Hey, Dominic, you're best off. Honestly, honestly, just don't ask a woman that question. Who gives a shit, man? It's not important. Just you should hope that the person you settle down with is experienced enough to not have any more curiosity. That's really what you're going That's for. That's a good advice. It's the same for a man. You want to you you don't want a man that is insecure because he's not had a lot of luck with women. Mm -hmm. You want a guy that's been around the block and has experienced all of that and got out of the system. I feel like the same is true for a woman. I wouldn't want a woman that's like, "Oh, you're the only one I've ever been with." And it's like, "Well, that's a lot of pressure for one." And for two, the curiosity that's going to come from being married to that person after 10, 15, 20, 25 years is going to be a lot to deal with. And most, and, and you've seen in this, mm -hmm. when most people get divorced after 15, 20, 25 years, they usually meet when they're like 20 in their, their lower 20s. Mm -hmm. And then they're in their 40s and it's like midlife crisis. And it's like, I'm tired. The, the children are grown. I'm done. I'm out. I want to go experience life. And then they start, uh, exploring with other men and we usually have the guy coming back because i don't know she cheated on me with all these people it's like 90 percent of our cases maybe that's overstating it maybe 70 percent, but it happens a lot you don't want somebody that's inexperienced i'm getting off the point the point is for this guy you have to learn how to date without purpose the fallacy of dating as a, a single person is you're dating with the explicit purpose of finding your he your happily ever after happily ever after does not exist. It is not a place. It is not an achievement. It is not like this grand place where you get and everything is going to be Perfect. peaches and cream. You're like in heaven because you're, you know, Cinderella on the castle. No, you're still going to have bills to pay, children to raise. The universe is still going to impose its will upon you. You're still going to have depression, medical issues, Anxiety. the grass is greener, anxieties, insecurities. Everything is going to happen. You're looking for somebody um, that makes your life better. You are who you are. There's no changing who you are or what you are. Come to terms with it, acknowledge it, and embrace it. And don't compromise it. If you want somebody to say, oh, that's, that's all well and good, I'd date you, but you have to, you know, make, you have to be just a little more assertive. Get the F out of here, assertive. How about, no, I don't. How about I am what I am? 
there's no changing who you're going to be. You don't compromise what you're going to be or who you're going to be for a person because you think that it's going to lead to this happily ever after. More often than not, it's going to become a situation where you're unequally yoked with your partner and inevitably it's going to blow up again. And there's no pressure. You've already been down the road uh, to divorce and survived. And so the illusion should be shattered that Disney and all of these movies, these enchanted stories where you have a prince and a princess and a castle where you have the big uh, whatever, it, that image is not real. And we teach our children that, and I feel like we set them up for failure. The correct answer to that question for anybody that's single is to learn how to date without purpose. And in the course of doing that, you'll define a purpose. And if it's with the right person where you guys fill in each other's gaps, you can turn that into something beautiful. But if you try to force it, you're going to end up settling. And when you settle, you're doomed to failure anyway. Almost ends up bad all the time. So that's all I got to say to that guy. Hey, how long have we been going? A little over two and a half hours. Oh. Oh, Jules says, uh, oh, talking about American Pie. <laughs> 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 Lulu says, sometimes I feel like I should be single. I don't know, man. Lots of people say that they feel like they should be single. Single is a double-edged sword. There's a lot of... Uh, there's I a do lot have of, a friend uh, who... And it's a male friend. I do have a friend who he's like, oh, I see my entire life being single. Like, I already know I'd envision it. He's happy with it. Well, good for him. And you know what? That's how I saw myself when I got divorced. I don't ever have to. I'm going to be single the rest of my life. And then I found one because I dated without purpose and it worked out. But when you say that you should be single when you're a married person or if you're attached or even if you're not, you think that's not a bad thing. Um, if you're saying that as a married person, I don't know. There's a lot going on in between lines with that. But the illusion of being single is simply this. All of this freedom to go out and explore and do all the things, do all the things that you want. But then you start indulging in that and then it becomes very stale itself. And then I find that the most of the people that do that kind of thing, that indulge their single tendencies, desires, wishes, or whatever, get tired of it very quickly. It's an illusion like everything else. It's, a, it's, a, it's the lake in the desert that you see on the horizon, the mirage, and you get there and it's just a bunch of dust and sand. It expires very quickly and your energy and appetite for it extinguish very quickly. And ultimately, if you can find a person uh, that you can navigate the universe and uh, overcome the universe trying to impose its will upon you, then you'll live a longer life. And the science bears that out. I think that a successful marriage, I don't know what the numbers are, but it adds years to your life. Single people usually live a very loud and violent, eventful dramatic life, life, and they flame out pretty dramatically. But I'll leave that to where it belongs. Uh, let's move on. Let's do, let's do one more one more. How long have we been going for? He said a little over two hours and a half. Yeah. But what's the exact time? Uh, I want to say two hours and like eight minutes. Yikes. Oh, well, we had like breaks in between. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, huh. From the female. Are we, so we did one from the male perspective. Let's do one from the female. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm 30. And honestly, I want to divorce my husband. Oh, my God. We've been at odds for a while. Anger, resentment, aggressive arguments, but we have a son who is about to turn one, and he is truly the okay. only reason, all right? Almost exactly like the other one, right? One years old, and he is truly the only reason I've stayed so long. I know he only wants to stay married off of principle and pride and the fact that is the fact that his family doesn't believe in divorce, he gives a shit about your family. But he also isn't willing to change to make effort either. This is funny because I just received the judgment from one of our clients. And of course, as I received it, the other party received it. And then she started posting everywhere. God doesn't believe in divorce. Blah, 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 blah. No, it doesn't matter. I mean, people think what they want. So he makes me feel shit like shit constantly. But he gets along with my family, have a routine, our son, etc. I just feel scared to leave. But the thought of living my life forever with this man makes me want to drink every day to escape. Um, and it, well, yeah. Okay. 
That's bad. That's what, very bad. I'll let you tackle this one, Melissa. What do you think? Me? Hmm. Okay, she's 30. I'm 30. So same age. She has a one-year-old, almost a one-year-old. I did have a friend in the same situation. She was not 30. She was 27 or 28 back then. I'm not 100% sure. She was around my age. Um, and actually, they never got married, but she was in that same, like, comfort zone where she was like, oh, he gets along with my family. Um, I I don't know if I should leave him or not, yada, 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 because um, my family doesn't believe in separation and stuff like that. She actually, when she was pregnant, tried to separate from him. And her family coerced, coerced her on not doing it, saying that she could be a bad mom because she was um, putting her child in a what is it? destroyed home because her their parents were going to be separated by the time the baby was born. And, I mean, she said aggression. She said... Um, a lot of anger issues and she also said that the thought of remaining with this man forever made her drink almost every single day if somebody if just the thought of being with somebody makes you want to abuse a substance that's a bad thing and let's not say she said alcohol okay some people do drugs some people uh do sugar some people just have gula i don't know if that's the way you say it in english but you just eat for eating some people do other things some people do reckless driving like there's a lot of bad things going on so i mean i would suggest you're in a good age uh you do have a one-year-old that's fine like nobody's gonna die for being a single mom so just bear with on that so if really really you believe that this person just is going to drive you insane up to the point where you're just gonna have to like cope with something else you should really think about leaving well here's what i got to say um just like the other guy she wants to everybody to know to know that she's martyred herself up to this point you got a one-year-old kid there's a lot going on when you have a one-year-old child there's postpartum depression there's the um Oh, she said about to turn one. Yeah, we don't know exactly. The burden of having to care for a toddler, it's just, it's its strikingly difficult. If you're a new parent raising a baby for the first time, you have this little person that is dependent on you 24 hours a day. And before that, you guys were all, it was just the two of you. Now you got oh, this little not, person. She's not such of a martyr as the other one. Because the other one's asking for advice. She's like, I want to do it. She's a hundred percent true. Well, like she specifically convinced. she specifically asked for advice. She says, "Do you have any advice?" She specifically asked. But the other one was not sure. This one is. Well, I don't she's think not this, more sure. Well, let's just assume that she's not sure. Okay, let's assume that she's not. Okay, so she wants to. I would just say, don't do it when your child is one, because a lot changes within a couple of years. I know the 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 point of the marriage that she's going through. It's the point where there's like sticker shock. You just had a kid. Her body has been ravaged by a pregnancy. It's probably still not recovered. And hormones she probably has place. insecurity issues that have led to lack of intimacy issues that have led to lots of arguments because of postpartum depression. She has, she's sleep deprived. She doesn't have any time to herself. She no. has no alone time. She's constantly having to deal with, um, taking care of the needs of a child, meaning she's neglecting her own needs, let alone her husband's needs. And her husband, there's not really any indication of how he's taking it, but they've had a lot of aggressive arguments. He's going through something similar. Your body has changed. It's probably not all that important to him. Um, but he's dealing with a lack of intimacy. He's probably also similarly sleep deprived. He cares enough about the child to, to want to be a part of his life. You have to your husband no, um caring about your body changes because i've seen this situation well yeah it happens but most husbands that genuinely love their wives don't give a shit generally exactly but i've seen it but she hasn't i feel like if that was a thing she would have just come out and said it because that's a she would have figured it out by now yeah so i'm assuming that the guy is like oh yeah you just had a kid of course you're gonna look a little bit different feel a little bit different it's just what i signed up for and so i have to assume that he's invested in this child because of what she said she said that we're both kind of just in it for the um for the child it's like that one song gladys knight neither one of us wants to be the first to say 
Goodbye. You don't know anything about that song. I bet you you don't know anything about it either, huh, Dominic? Nope. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, they're both going through something, man. Now is not the time to get a divorce. What, you're going to get a divorce, custody and visitation battle, divorce proceedings, um, child support. Um, you're going to be single with a one-year-old. I don't know. I'm, I'm still thinking about the part of, like, it makes me want to drink every single time. Well, that has that may or may not have anything to do with uh, this guy. It could have, look, uh, let's just take him out of the equation. And now she's single mom with an infant under one years old. And she's having to care for this child and be responsible for this child 24 hours a day. No alone time. Waking up every hour and a half to two hours, constantly running on four and five hours of sleep, body changing, postpartum depression, all of this stuff. You don't need a man to make you drink when you're going through all of all, all of those things. You understand? And so you add him to the equation and he's either a byproduct of the depression or he is just another variable adding to it. He might be innocent altogether. They're just both on each other's nerves. And it probably has very little to do with them directly. Because if he took the child out of the equation, I'm guessing they would probably be better off, at least in terms of their relationship. They're having to cope with this new variable and it's difficult. And so I can't even say for sure that he is the source of her wanting to drink every day. I spoken to many people that have gone through very similar things and then specifically around this age. And we have a case right now where somebody literally had this and then they are going through the divorce and four months later, Oh, I'm pregnant with another one. And now I need custody orders for that one. And it's like, Oh my God, that's not anything to do with the guy. That's a lot of other stuff that has to There's do other with things going on. other things. Mm -hmm. And so I cannot say, look, anybody wants to get divorced, they can. I'm just saying now is probably not the time. Let things settle a little bit. Wait until the kid's maybe three or four when it starts getting a little bit easier. The kid's potty trained, sleeps through the night, and uh, things start to lighten up on the relationship. And if it's still that way, then, you know, fine. But for right now, get your guy, get yourselves into some kind of therapy and start communicating what you guys are going through. If that doesn't work, you can always get a divorce. But right now is not the time to start diagnosing the source of depression because there's a million different things to be depressed about in her life. And I'm just going to leave her like that. Wait. Just wait. Just a little bit. Hey, Dominic said something. Oh, Lulu said, would you say because of like having like all the dating apps or social media, is that kind of what makes it hard? Dominic said, yes, dating apps and or social media leads to lots of meaningless meetup dates. But hey, Dominic, that's nothing new, man. Before Tinder, you just like went up and talked to people. Match you know what I used to do when I was like <laughs> 17, 18 year old? Like I saw I saw a pretty girl. I would like go and talk to her. That's the way you just used to do it. You had to. There was no, like, dating apps. Right? There was no intermediate. Like, you just had to. No, man. You had to work up the courage and build up the social skills and just, hey, that girl's pretty. Let me go talk to her. And then you would. And then it's, um, hey, all my friends used to give me props. Like, wow, I'm going to go talk to anybody. I don't give a shit, man. Tell me no, man. <laughs> but you have to go through that process. You It's, it's part of developing your, who you're going to be as a person, as a man. Dating apps, um, all they do is they facilitate the meetups faster i'd imagine but it's no different you still have to i don't know ultimately if you're going to have a meaningful relationship with anybody um the dating apps go out of the equation and you guys have to learn how to communicate with each other one-on-one -on -one. lulu says uh, you are wise beyond your years dominic what did you say that was so wise what did you say <laughs> lots of meaningless meetups and i found that it's not worth it to force a relationship but rather let it happen organically Oh, mm. totally. <laughs> That's my experience. It belongs in a on a fortune cookie. <laughs> no, hey man, whether you meet on a dating app or not, um, communication and learning how to communicate with the person is really important. Um, so it plays a role. I think it just expedites everything. 
it's definitely not how it used to be like in the 90s. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's what I have to say to that, that lady. Do you have any closing words, Melissa, for this person? No. All I right. like your advice. I think that we're going to stop right there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the Tilt Lawyer podcast. We're going to be um, signing off for now. Next week, maybe we'll check in on the Chad Daybell. Maybe we'll uh, start recapping or um, putting together what's going on with the Karen Reed case in another week or so. I'm kind of curious about where prosecution is going with their case because right now they're, I feel like they're just not scoring. We'll see. Um, if you guys want me to, uh, to uh, cover another case, let me know in the comments. Other than that, um, unless you got anything to say to anybody else. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, we will see. I didn't do the intro. Pow. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic will put that in. Hey, guys, it's been fun, but we got to go. It's like 2 o'clock and it's Friday. Oh.